Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, February 1st, 2022 concurrent regular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. The City Council is conducting this meeting from the City Council Chamber and staff are complying with the current regulations of the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA for safe indoor meetings. Mayor Pro Tem Silva is attending the meeting via teleconference. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54953B, the public shall have the opportunity to address the City Council at the teleconference location. <coughs> All votes during the, this teleconferencing session will be conducted by roll call vote. The teleconference location is accessible to the public. Members of the public may provide live, remote, oral public comment via the City's Zoom video conferencing platform or may attend the, the meeting in person. We require that all in-person attendees uh, wear masks consistent with Contra Costa County health orders. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I want to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. Thus, if you desire to speak to an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council considers that item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda titled Public Communications, which is for public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communications should not relate to an item that is on the agenda this evening. Consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be initially allocated for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public communication for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the open session portion of the meeting if necessary. This process is consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook and will allow for all public comments to be received during the meeting for items not on the agenda. When I open the public comment period, please use the raise hand feature or press star 9 if you're connected by audio only. This will alert staff that you have a public comment that you would like to provide. We ask that everyone who wishes to speak on an item, please use the raise hand feature to state your intent to speak when the item is called. If you're attending in person, please complete a yellow speaker identification card and line up behind the lectern at the appropriate time. Wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and city of residence for the record. Please note that in-person public comments will be taken before any remote public comments. Please keep in mind also that this is a city business meeting. The city council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively and that all members of the public have a full, fair and equal opportunity to be heard. All remarks should be addressed to the city council. Please do not use profanity during your comments. Given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings, and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. <clears throat> Written comments submitted and received up to two hours before the meeting have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. To provide a live remote public comment, use, uh, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID and password are, the ID is 825-4705-3180, passcode is 220883. Should you choose to not provide comments but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in one of the following ways. YouTube Live, visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel. Cable broadcast, Comcast Channel 28 in Incorporated Walnut Creek, Rossmore Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. You can also live stream the meeting online on the city's website. At this time, please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Darling? Here. Councilmember Haskew? Here. Um, Councilmember Wilk is absent due to a prior commitment. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Here. And Mayor Francois? 
I'm here. Next item on the agenda is a presentation for the library strategic plan. I invite Rob Tigett and Alexandra Bernbach of the Walnut Creek Libraries to provide the Contra Costa County Library Strategic Plan Progress Report. Welcome. Thank you, City Council. And Rob, okay, there we go. Yeah, I'm here, thank you. <laughs> so thank you everyone for uh, your time this evening. I know we have about 10 minutes, so we'll be moving pretty quickly through our presentation this evening. This is an update to our strategic plan. And obviously uh, things have changed in the last couple of years with the pandemic. And so we wanted to give a progress report on our strategic plan to give you an update and also speak on the amazing work that we've been doing and how we've been pivoting our services during the time of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Contra Costa County Library has risen to the moment on a number of occasions. Um, looking back at the pandemic in particular and how we pivoted, we, um, as a library system, printed personal protective equipment and were an honorable mention in the 3D printed personal protective equipment program um, for printing masks as well as the um, earband connectors for um, first responders. 76 staff were dispatched as disaster service workers, um, serving in a variety of different uh, responsibilities throughout the county. Staff volunteered with West Contra Costa Unified School District for food distribution, particularly during the pandemic to ensure that we um, were able to help distribute food to our, the communities that we serve, particularly those with um, kids who qualify for school lunches. We expanded lunch in the library to include food box giveaways. So in addition to just lunches um, for the school community um, and for the school students, we then expanded the program and have started receiving um, boxes of family size meals, which can last for several days, several prepared meals. Two branches became COVID-19 testing sites, the Pinole Library, and as you know, the Ignacio Valley Library. And shipping staff delivered personal protective equipment to donation drives. Next slide, please. The buildings closed, our digital doors began to open. In 2020, our doors shuttered and the library immediately needed to pivot. So we did so by meeting a surge in our digital demand and we invested 60% of our collection budgets into electronic materials. And on the left here, you'll see our website visits, which indicate in millions the number of users. And on 2021, you will see that that number spiked quite greatly. We reached a record-breaking 1 million digital book checkouts, illustrating the continued growth and importance of libraries digital lending. We far exceeded our record of online activity in 2021, and that is over 4.8 million visits. Next slide, please. So the library also looked at distance literacy tools, particularly during the shelter in place um, and continuing forward. So in 2019, we had introduced the new visual library catalog for easier searching. So patrons could search staff and patron lists, see book suggestions, read critical reviews um, and connect with each other as well. Then during the pandemic in 2020, we introduced free print printing and scanning services. Patrons could print from their Wi-Fi from their wireless devices and pick up the print jobs at the library at our front door service um, locations. Thank you. Um, in 2021, we began circulating Wi-Fi hotspots. We started with 125 portable Wi-Fi hotspots, and we now have a collection close to 250 circulating Wi-Fi hotspots, which serve those that may not have steady or reliable internet access and has also been a great help to many students that are studying um, while their schools go um, online. And in 2021, we also expanded online tutoring to include resume writing, citizen process help, and benefits application help through some of our wonderful databases, including BrainFuse and JobNow and VetNow. Next slide, please. In 2020, we established the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee to help the library accurately reflect and serve the diverse population of Contra Costa County. 
In 2020 and 2021, the library contracted with Dr. Lori Watson, educator, consultant, and founder of RaceWork. Dr. Watson led library staff at all levels in challenging vital two-day workshops on racial equity. Her work continues with the library in 2022. And one thing we will include is that all library staff did take that training. It was mandatory and it was a rather excellent training and has helped advance the library and our EDI committee's work. Next slide, please. So the library has also continued to be committed to and focus on barrier-free service. In 2019, the library said goodbye to fines, erasing all outstanding debts for patrons, um, particularly because we'd found, as many libraries did, that um, late fees and fines had disproportionately affected um, families and patrons from lower economic backgrounds. In 2020, we overrode account blocks and extended expiring accounts to ensure access for all during shelter in place and front door service so that everyone could access our online materials, um, as well as request and pick up physical items. And in 2021, we expanded base hours at all libraries to 40 hours per week, thus ensuring equitable base open hours at each location throughout the county. Next slide, please. Uh, these graphs demonstrate the library visits that we saw uh, 27, 2018 through the present of 2020 and 2021. Uh, you will see that there's a dip and we obviously did expect that with our doors being closed for so long. We did have a front door service option for several months and then we reopened libraries in 2021. And so you can see from 2017 and 18 on through to 2018 and 2019, we were actually doing quite well and we were having a growth in our visits and then that started to drop. The, the story we'd like to show here is that we were on a great path and we are still on a great path and our library visits are going to continue to grow as we rebalance over time. And with our circulation, uh, it's a similar metric in that we saw growth from 17, 18 through 18, 19. And then we see a bit of a crest. And what, what that is a result of is a lack of physical materials. We talked about the digital materials earlier and their circulation. And so it's rather mir miraculous and pretty amazing that we were able to keep circulation statistics of in 2019 and 2020 to be commensurate to those of 17 and 18, when much of our time, the doors of the library were actually closed. It's rather remarkable. Uh, next slide, please. So you can also see our um, programs. And as we see, we did take, unfortunately, um, a bit of a, a dip when the pandemic started and has continued. Um, as the city council probably knows, uh, we are not doing any in-person programming at the moment um, until we get guidance from the county health services department. Um, and so at the moment we've pivoted um, starting at the beginning of the pandemic and continuing on to more virtual and online programming, which has been received rather well and we're continuing to do so. Um, that being said, we are excited for when it is safe to be able to um, get back to in-person programming once again, and we're looking forward to that as well. But keeping in mind that the biggest priority for the library is the health and safety of its patrons and its staff. Um, currently, we are exploring and continue to develop robust uh, virtual online programming. Mm -hmm. You can Thanks. also... Oh. You can also see um, on the right hand side our active users. So these are library card holders that have had activity on their library card. Um, I believe the metric is for within the span of three years. Um, and what we did in 2020 was we actually um, purged all of the old inactive accounts so that we could start with an active with an accurate baseline. So going forward, we'll have an accurate baseline of active card holders from 2020 onward. Um, and we are excited to see that number increase. Next slide, Thanks. please. <laughs> okay, so over the last few years, we have some additional accomplishments that we would like to highlight. Uh, we in El Cerrito Library launched the LGBTQIA plus special collection. Our Readers Initiative Program, which is uh, a countywide program that focused on um, exploring the, the collections and developing them in a way um, that gave more usage to our patrons. And by that, we mean merchandising materials, facing them out so that they appear more like a bookstore, bringing our books to the edges of our shelves. 
and then also doing a lot of weeding in our collections because we knew that there were a lot of materials which needed to go so that the more valuable and more wanted materials could shine in our communities. And as a result, our circulation did go up. Um, we launched a blog highlighting our resources and programs during COVID, and that was a way to offer resources to our community when they would come to our website and trying to find out more information about COVID-19 and the, the programs and resources in the county. Uh, as Ali mentioned earlier, we, we have the lunch in the library program, as well as the food box distribution for families. And then lastly, uh, we have the contactless home delivery of library materials. And I'm happy to say that this bullet point is mostly about Walnut Creek. And so the Walnut Creek Library partnered with Neighbor Express here at the Walnut Creek City, and they were already doing a grocery delivery service. And so the library partnered with them to be able to expand grocery delivery to include library delivery. In addition to partnering with Neighbor Express and reaching users who were homebound during the pandemic and beyond, we also worked with Rossmore. The Walnut Creek Library had a partnership in place prior to the pandemic where we were shuttling books back and forth between the library and offering them through the Gateway Clubhouse. That service ended uh, because of the pandemic and also because it needed some updates uh, around how the books were being delivered. And so instead what we've done is put a solution in place known as the Rossmore Lockers. And what those are are self-service Amazon style lockers that are in the Gateway Clubhouse of Rossmore, meaning that patrons can request items and they come directly to those lockers and they're able to pick them up anytime the Gateway Clubhouse is open. The success of that program has been great and we've expanded uh, into other areas and we're looking at offering similar lockers in Richmond where we do not have a service point as a library, but we do have community there. It's part of Contra Costa County and we are installing the lockers into their senior center. Next slide, please. Okay, and um, we are really excited because we are pretty much on par for rebuilding or refreshing a new library throughout the Contra Costa County library system in pretty much every year, which is um, a pretty spectacular accomplishment we're proud of. So from Elsa Bronte's reopening um, to the public after sustaining major fire damage in November of 2019, we then had the North Richmond Reading Room, the early literacy reading room at Shields Reed Community Center, which opened in February of 2020. The Project Second Chance offices um, moved in May 2020 and opened up a central county office space um, in dedicated, dedicated solely to Project Second Chance in downtown Concord at Toro Santos Plaza. Um, pleasant, oh, Antioch refresh, sorry. <laughs> so the Antioch refresh happened in the spring of 2021 with interior improvements, um, carpeting, new paint and new shelving. It looks beautiful. Um, the Concord refresh just happened um, in, actually, there were two refreshes for Concord in 2020. Um, the branch underwent flooring replacement and exterior improvements. And just recently, the Concord Library had a children's room refresh. So now there are fresh, vibrant colors and more interactive um, play models, as well as new shelving. And finally, the Pleasant Hill Library, which is um, still under construction, but construction is moving along um, spectacularly and it's set to reopen its brand new library, um, we're hoping in spring of 2022. Next slide, please. Okay, looking forward. Uh, the library is responding with resilience and urgency to evolving needs by adapting and expanding services. Reimagining the means, we remain on a mission and we are bringing people and ideas together. And we are committed to doing that regardless of what the pandemic brings us. We will not be put down by that and we will continue forward and we will always bring people and ideas together. That is our mission. Next slide, please. And during front door service, we received a number of wonderful heartfelt notes from our community. Here's one that came into the Ignacio Valley Library in a beautiful postcard. Um, to all you kind souls who make the library run, thank you. You have adapted much and given much. The books I get allow me to calm my mind and emotionally recover so I can get on with this thing called life. Thank you for all the hidden ways you make that happen for countless people you serve, and even the people who are touched by the people that you serve. 
And this is a wonderful jumping off point to um, just celebrate and again announce that we are so pleased that the Ignacio Valley Library will be reopening um, next Monday, February 7th. We open at 10 a.m. And we are thrilled to welcome the community back. So currently staff are in the building, hard at work preparing for our reopening. We can't wait to see everyone. Um, of course, we're following the latest COVID safety protocols. So as is true with all of the libraries in Contra Costa County, masks are required per the county mandate. Um, but we look forward to seeing everyone smiling behind their masks and we can't wait to welcome you all back. Allie and Rob, thank you so much. We can't wait to see you at the Ignacio Valley Library and to see it reopened on the 7th. Th thank you for all the, thank you for this presentation and yeah. more importantly for all the hard work you've done over the last two years to keep the libraries fresh and relevant and reaching uh, constituents. We, we sincerely appreciate that. I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Mayor Pro Tem. I had just one, and that was uh, in terms of, do you think there'll be a, a move afoot any time in the near future for digital library cards that you could uh, keep in your Apple wallet or, or something similar? Ooh. <laughs> so we don't have, that's a good question. Um, I know with um, Ali, I believe in the, like, can you store your card in the Biblio Commons? Mm. Yes, I think that you can. Um, so you, you can store it online. It does make, unfortunately, our self-checkout machines, um, if you were going to come in in person and scan your digital card, wouldn't read that at the moment. Um, mm. But we also do have e-cards available um, for patrons that want to just access our e-resources. We do encourage people to get a full service card um, that just gives you benefits to to everything that we offer, but um, that's a really good idea for a digital card that would be compatible with Apple Wallet. Yeah. As someone who, who routinely forgets his physical library card, I would personally appreciate it. I, I usually don't forget my phone, but I do forget my physical library card. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you both. Have a good evening, and we'll see you, you at too. the Ignacio Valley Library soon. We appreciate it. Thank you for their time. Thank you very much. All right, next on the agenda is the consent calendar. I will be pulling item C, which is a proclamation related to Black History Month. Does any other council member wish to pull an item for discussion? Does any member of the public wish to comment on an item on the consent calendar? If so, if you'd please fill out a yellow speaker card or use the raise hand feature if you're joining us by Zoom or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. I notice we have one speaker in the chambers and then we'll go to Zoom, Mr. Bennett. Yes or no? There it is. See, I told you. Okay. So Black History Month. It's an interesting part of my life story, and I, I hope we do more about it here, a lot more. Uh, have you been reading the repatriation with the Huntington Beach family that received their property back after 40 or 50 years? I have very specific examples that I've uncovered in this county. Some debts need to be paid. A lot of people have been hurt. And I know it very well because I dealt with forced integration busing when I finished my high school years in Florida. I was only there for three weeks and I got beat up in a race riot because of the way the schools were structured. Very bad place at the time. And I saw the racism firsthand, stabbings, beatings, all that. And so there's a, car, there's a page turning in this Black History Month. I, I will give a lot of comment to this police here because I actually sat in the middle of the riot where the officers let me sit on the inside 
And I noticed something after the way it was handled that more people of color showed up. And you guys know I've been on the street, so I see the faces all the time. I've done a fantastic job there because now people are not afraid to come to Walnut Creek. But I have a good example of a, a woman that I saw of color, had her car towed away be just before Christmas about four years ago, car full of presents for her children, and then they towed the car away because she didn't have a license or a tags. It was a shame. And that's the kind of repatriation that would be good because some people have been targeted. And that's something that's no longer here, but somewhat in the room. I can't tell you exactly who it is. So in terms of that, I know what Black History Month means, and I'd like to see more. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, any other speakers inside the chamber would like to address the council on an item on the consent calendar? Not seeing any. Is there any member on Zoom that would like to address the council on the consent calendar? If so, please raise your hand or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. We have a couple speakers. We'll go ahead and bring in Don. Hi, Don, are you there? Uh, here I am. Are you got me? I do. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'll go ahead now. Yes, please. It has been said, if your premise is wrong, your conclusion will most likely be wrong. In the past few months, members of the city council and others giving testimony have given misinformation to the public concerning the activities in front of Planned Parenthood. Rather than Don, I'm going to st stop you right there. We're just taking public comment right now on the consent calendar. You want to you want to ring in during public communications, which we'll get to in just a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. No problem. Okay. Do we have any other public comment on the consent calendar? Uh, no additional speakers. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So then I'll accept a motion on items A, B, and D through F. Well, you made my job easy. I am going to make that motion. And I will second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Haskew? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. And Mayor Francois? Aye. Motion carries. Item C on the consent calendar is an adoption of a proclamation recognizing the month of February 2022 as Black History Month and February 13th to 19th as African American Mental Health Awareness Week. I'm going to read this proclamation and then I'll have the honor of moving it. Whereas during Black History Month, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by black Americans to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. Whereas Black History Month grew out of the establishment in 1926 of Negro History Week by Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Whereas the 2022 national themes for the observance focuses on the importance of black health and wellness, this theme acknowledges the legacy of not only black scholars and medical practitioners in Western medicine, but also other activities and initiatives that encourage well being in the black community. And whereas the observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued need to battle racism and build a society that lives up to its democratic ideals. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek continues to work toward being an inclusive community in which all citizens past, present, and future are respected and recognized for their contributions and potential contributions to our community, the state, the country, and the world. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek is proud to honor the history and contributions of black Americans in our community, and supports the theme of honoring black families who are part of our city landscape. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek recognizes that recent years have provided significant struggles for black citizens throughout this nation in light of serious events, from social unrest following the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, to living under the threat of COVID-19. 
whereas according to the National Institute on Mental Health and National Alliance on Mental Illness, some mental illnesses are more prevalent in the black American community as compared to other groups in the United States, whereas mental health and substance use issues and the devastating impact of COVID-19 are among the leading causes of health challenges for black Americans in our region, whereas the city of Walnut Creek is committed to emp empowering black American residents by promoting the benefits of mental health services through education, advocacy, policy development, raising awareness, and decreasing the stigma surrounding mental health. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek is collaborating with local government agencies and community-based organizations to support the innovative A3 mobile crisis response pilot housed in Contra Costa Health Services to expand resources enhancing mental health in the black American community. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek supports and encourages the efforts made to create the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub as an easily accessible regional contact center for people experiencing a mental health crisis, whereas the city of Walnut Creek supports efforts for local organizations to honor those who have or are, or are suffering from mental illness and supports efforts to strengthen families and their roles in sharing history and shaping the future of our black residents. And whereas the city of Walnut Creek acknowledges the Miles Hall Foundation's designation of February 15th as Miles Hall Day of Remembrance and applauds the foundation's work with local schools to launch a community-wide kindness campaign in February to focus on kindness, equity, and inclusion, and gratitude and wellness. Now, therefore, I, Matt Francois, Mayor of the City of Walnut Creek, on behalf of the Walnut Creek City Council, do hereby recognize the month of February as Black History Month and further recognize the second week of February as African American Mental Health Awareness Week and offer support and hope for those in Walnut Creek's Black American community who are impacted by mental illness and honor our Black families. I would like to move adoption of that proclamation. Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mayor Francois? Aye. Councilmember Haskew? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. And Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're moving on to public communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed request clarification or refer the item to staff. Consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be allocated at this time for public communications. For items not on the agenda, additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the meeting if necessary. If any member of the public wishes to provide public comments and you are on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine. For those who desire, uh, who, for those who desire to provide public comment, please raise your hand now so we can identify the total number of speakers that desire to speak. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks, and the Zoom feed will cut you off at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I will note that the time is 6.35, and we will make... We will take public comments on items not on the agenda until approximately 7.05, and then the remainder of any such comments at the end of the open session portion of the meeting. I see we have a few people lined up. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathy Hemingway, I'm Executive Director of Walnut Creek Downtown, and tonight I'm here along with my colleague Bob Linscheid from the Walnut Creek uh, Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau. Uh, to announce the formation of a joint effort um, between our organizations called Coalition for Walnut Creek. The purpose of this coalition is to bring community organizations together to influence public policy that furthers Walnut Creek's significance in the region. Mm -hmm. As Walnut Creek downtown represents over 650 downtown businesses as, and associate members, we are proud to take the lead through this coalition to streamline local, uh, local efforts, explore opportunities that strengthen the city's economic future, and continue to establish Walnut Creek as a regional leader. 
Walnut Creek Downtown is looking forward to a renewed partnership with the Chamber of Commerce as we form this community coalition. Both organizations represent Walnut Creek, a wide ranging business community, and we see this coalition as an opportunity to help strengthen and unify their voices. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hemingway. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. For the record, I'm Bob Lynchide, President and CEO of the Walla Creek Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Bureau. Um, we are extremely excited to join our partners in Walla Creek Downtown with the formation of this coalition. This effort will also provide an invitation to community organizations to join us. Uh, we are <clears throat> of the fundamental belief that when business succeeds, our community thrives. And the reverse is also true. When our community thrives, business succeeds. Walnut Creek is open for business, and we believe that as a regional force, Walnut Creek is the most inclusive and vibrant city for innovation and entrepreneurship in the Bay Area. It was particularly gratifying to be in the audience earlier today when your conversation took place with DRAA, Diablo Regional Arts Association. It proves, as Council Member Askey would say, arts is commerce. And we believe that uh, this collaboration between us and downtown will include many organizations like DRA as we continue forward. We appreciate the opportunity later this month to present our goals for the coalition as the council uh, meets again. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Lynchide. Hi, my name is Pete Bennett. Um, I, I guess I have a distinctly different story. So I once had a business here in Walnut Creek. Actually, I had five offices, a computer store, and then a software development firm on Oak Road, Oak Park, and on Sar Saranet. I've lost my corporations, I've lost my life insurance. I have, and I need to emphasize this, in just about every business that I've had, where I've paid lease money. I've had a police officer show up. And within that, I've been defrauded. I'm not talking small money here. I'm not talking a box of paper or a bad check. I'm talking like a million dollar trust. Okay? Now, I don't know if you heard about it, but somebody fired off a couple of rounds over my head over by CVS. I'm sitting in my car because I'm homeless because I don't have a car that was stolen by somebody here that told the B&D towing that the tow charge included 4,500 in tickets and by the time it was done it was 6,000 and I didn't have $6,000 to get my car out. So I lost it. That was at Broadway Point. Now. I'm recovering from medical. It's a constant factor in my life because I get beat up, strangled, ribs get broken. When you consider buying some more stuff for the Lesher Center, you're going to have to be prepared what I know about the Leshers and the Nedgedleys and other things that have gone on around here. What I've learned and pieced together on, on upends everything you think happened. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, James Cook um, from Antioch. And uh, I just wanted to comment on the last meeting that uh, I'd like to say thank you to the mayor or to the uh, attorney. Uh, I thought your presentation was very uh, non-opinionated based upon facts only, and it was nice to hear that. Um, but I would like to say at the uh, conclusion of the last city council meeting, you all voted in favor of enacting a 100, 100 foot buffer zone around Planned Parenthood in this city. And after you called for a very short recess, you came back and you read a very lengthy statement, all of you did, that you all had prepared ahead of time. You said on the onset of this issue 
that the law states that you have to explore all options before you consider enacting a buffer zone, and that would be your last action. You have not looked at all the options. And what I've witnessed here in these last few months is a city that does not want to look at facts, does not want to hear the truth. You have took one side of this whole issue, and even after the officer and the lawyer have come up and said the accident that happened out there was not by us being a dist distraction, by a, a police report, by the police officer, by the attorney, and in the same meeting, you turned around and said, I know what they said, but I still think that it was you guys. That's what you have said. It's recorded. You can go back and watch it. Yes, yes, you did. Go back and watch it. I have. You have made a decision based upon no facts. There's no evidence of all of those accusations, and that is what they are. Thank you, Simply Mr. Cook, for your comment. We, any, are there any other speakers in the chamber that would like to address the council on an item that's not on the agenda? Sure. We have one. No problem. Good evening, your honorable magistrates. My name is Dory. I've been in the community, Antioch community, in this community for over 31 years. It's not too late to do the right thing. Speaking of the buffer zone around Planned Parenthood, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. When you look around at all of us here, why are we wearing masks? Can you tell me? To save lives? Is that right? Is it because you want to show that you care about other people? Well, those little ones need their lives saved. And I know you all weren't here and you didn't build Planned Parenthood, but you do have an opportunity to allow those little ones that can't speak for themselves, to have their parents be able to receive help that they want, that they don't know is available to them. So you have the opportunity to do the right thing and not have the buffer zone. Accept and hope, and God help is offered to you today. Every person is created in God's image and is valuable in his sight. However, we all make decisions to disobey our creator. This is called sin. Sin separates us from God. But because he loves us, he sent Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless life and then died to pay the penalty for our sins. After his death, Jesus rose again on the third day. He defeated death so all who turn from sin could put their trust in him. And that's what he offers you today. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any other speakers in the chamber that would like to address the council on during public communication? I'm not seeing any, so we'll turn to Zoom. First speaker is user BG. Hello, my name is Barbara Guinness. I've been, oops, I've been a resident of Walnut Creek since 1996. In uh, late January, 
of uh, 2021, I heard from a neighbor who read a bike blog that in Southwest Lime Ridge, a high speed bike flow trail was being planned and was moving forward quickly. No one in the neighborhood, including the homeowner association seemed to know about it. Although the mountain uh, bike flow trail was planned to be within 500 feet of homes. On February 1st, I attended my first pros meetings. So I learned about pros and I listened to the detailed plans of the changes for Lime Ridge open space, including the bike flow trail. And then in April, I attended another pros meeting where they talked about the extension of the uh, bike flow trail over by the golf course. Again, uh, putting it above a hill, uh, on a hill, right, right, you know, down about a few hundred feet from homes. Um, I wondered why the commission had met for two years and had never said anything to neighboring stakeholders around the area. Then in June uh, 2021, I learned there was an environmental report being done by the flow trail. Uh, no one divulged that there was a draft report out there that had been out there since March 2021. Seems like the only way to communicate with the city regarding high speed bike flow trail is with city council. As you know, you've heard me many times. There were only two pros meetings last year where you could talk about the flow trail. October uh, of um, the October pros meeting in 2021, a new commissioner reported that there was a Walnut Creek open space uh, letter with concerns about the bike flow trail and other changes to Lime Ridge. Public Work quickly advised that they had not read the letter yet, so they couldn't comment on it. Then on January 22, uh, 2022 learned through a mountain biking website again that the trails committee had met in November 2021 and they had voted the whole committee voted to move forward with everything just as is so I wondered why there are so many secrets thank you very much thank you Miss Guinness next speaker next speaker is Don Hi, Don, are you on? Check your mute button. Hello, Don. Now is the time for public communications. All right, then I, we appear to have lost Don. I'm gonna close public communications. Would any of my colleagues like to ask any uh, questions or have any comments related to the public comments of staff before we move on? Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question for the city attorney. Um, we've received some additional comments this evening about um, the direction we provided at the recent meeting about the Planned Parenthood in a buffer zone. Can you explain for the public why we're not reacting to the comments from this evening? Um, yes, the initially the council, as a matter of course, doesn't respond to items that are stated in public communications um, because they're not agendized items. Um, the council has previously provided direction uh, to prepare for council's consideration an ordinance. The council has not yet adopted any ordinance. And I, I would just also add that there was a statement made this evening that the council has not received any evidence in support of such an ordinance, and I would disagree with that statement. So the reason we're not responding tonight is because it has not been proper. It has not been agendized to be on the meeting and we need to have it agendized so the publicly, public is aware that we are meeting and discussing it. That is correct. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. With that, we're going to move on to council member and staff announcements, reports on activities or requests. First up is closed session announcements, Mr. City Attorney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There were no, there was no closed session today, and therefore no closed session announcements. That makes sense. 
City Manager. I do not have an update this evening, Mayor. Okay, let's move on to City Council Member reports on AB 1234 activities, Council Member assignments, and various activities and upcoming events. Council Member Darling. I'll kick it off, thank you. Um, and let's see, what's been going on for the last two weeks? I've got to go to the Chamber of Commerce and the Convention Visitors Bureau at the new representative to those. Was interested to hear a lot about what the Chamber is doing with their new strategic plan, and I think tonight we saw some of the work that's coming out of that. And the Convention Visitors Bureau talked about the um, rebranding that they've done and how successful that is at driving um, interest on the website, and that was good to hear. Uh, for MCE, we only had one executive committee meeting, and we are setting up a subgroup to work on it compensation for the management team there because our compensation to date has been um, not following a standard procedure. So we're going to regularize that procedure, um, even though we love our CEO, Don Weiss. She's done a great job. Um, and then the last thing, uh, Council Member, or Mayor Pro Tem Silva and I had the Housing and Community Development Subcommittee meeting yesterday, and we talked about the community outreach that's going to be happening on both the housing element and the safety element for the general plan. Those are going to be really important um, workshops, people that have an interest in housing, um, from homelessness to affordable housing to density downtown. Those meetings are going to be in March, and so um, they will be featured on our website, and everybody, there will be a community survey, uh, outreach to stakeholders, and at least two public workshops. So if you're interested in housing, and we all are because we all live in them, look for that. Good report, thank you. Council Member Haskew. Thank you, the first thing I have to talk about is the Walnut Creek Job Fair. Oh, you can't see it, we'll have to read it. Um, it's, it's the Arts and Rec Job Fair. It is going to be on Thursday, February 3rd from 4.30 to 7 p.m. at the Shadelands Arts Center. Um, join, this is your chance to join Walnut Creek, the Arts and Rec. We are looking for enthusiastic, creative, community-oriented people to join our team as summer camp counselors, building attendants, coaches for after-school sports, gym attendants, professional teaching artists, lifeguards, swim instructors, preschool co-teachers, ticket agents, house managers. There are part-time jobs, flexible schedules, some nights, weekends, and seasonal shifts available. If you have any questions, please check the website at walnut-creek.org slash arts and rec. And I think that's a glorious opportunity. All ages are encouraged to participate. I attended the Contra Costa Transportation Authorities regular meeting and the item of highlight was the discussion about the impact of potential 13,500 houses on our transportation system. It was our initial meeting and we were trying to work with Concord to determine when we were going to have the, when Contra Costa Transportation Authority and the regional transportation committees Transpact is ours, um, are going to be participating with input to um, their um, general plan adjustments. And uh, so that was, we've opened the dialogue. Um, I also attended the Assistant Transportation Task Force and um, we are trying to set up our giant guiding principles to help people of, um, who are elderly or have disabilities um, to get from here to there as easily as um, other people can do. And I have my driver's comment, and the subject is yellow traffic lights. Yellow traffic lights mean caution. The light is about turn to turn red, not step on the gas, the light is about to turn red. Um, I've watched so many people just try and scoot through after the light is 
red while they're in the intersection, and that's wrong. But this also ap applies to pedestrians. Pedestrians have countdowns and things like that, and it is not appropriate when the countdown is down to two to just run across the street. There could be a driver waiting to turn right and wipe you out as you get to the before the sidewalk. There are lots of dangers. These items are meant to be safety oriented and to help control traffic so that we all can get to where we're going safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want I want you to know I record your PSAs and I I have my 18 year old son watch them. <laughs> Who's a new driver? No, they're, they're, it's important guidance, and we all need to slow down. People are in a, in a hurry to get to school, to get to work, to get to shopping or wherever they need to go, and we all need to be careful of the people around us. So thank you for that reminder. Thank you. I hope he likes me the next time he sees me. He does. And another council member he likes, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Well, I remember reading to him at Read Across America when he was five and in kindergarten. So um, I'd like to um, add one point on the report from the Housing Committee. So when we were discussing yesterday the upcoming update of the housing element and the outreach efforts, we mentioned to staff and the consultant that we thought if they prepared um, a PSA email that our council members could send to our associates, et cetera, Act, inviting them to the meetings, but also the workshops, and but also to take the survey. So we should be prepared for that. And I appreciate staff's work on that. At the um, January 27th Golden Rain Foundation Board meeting, I attended it and gave a report on things that have been happening in Walnut Creek since early December at their last board meeting when the mayor at that time was Mayor Francois was the liaison to the board. And they were very appreciative of hearing an update on the organized retail theft and the efforts that we um, undertook, as well as um, some other items of interest. And I'm sure we will hear more from them on a couple of things that they're very interested in. <clears throat> I would like to, um, on the subject of the organized retail theft, I want to thank our city manager for his participation last week in a statewide roundtable for council members and city staff on the subject of organized retail theft. I thought the dialogue was exceptional and there were great ideas coming from council members, city staff and police chiefs and police officers from across the state. So Dan, thank you for participating in that. The um, last week at the January meeting of Recycle Smart, which the mayor and I represent the city on, we took three items um, up of interest. One was we adopted the new rates that will become effective March 1st through February 2023 for our garbage recycling and organic waste. The rates went up by about 2.37% for our residential, which is about 62 cents per month. Most of this is a result of labor costs and fuel costs. As we know, the gasoline at the pump has gotten more and more expensive. But I would um, want to point out that Walnut Creek's rates are the lowest in Contra Costa County and amongst other communities just on the other side of the tunnel as well. We also at Recycle Smart Board meeting looked um, adopted new policies about employee compensation. We really wanted to better align our compensation policies with the compensation policies of our member agencies. At the same time, we wanna be able to attract and retain good high quality employees. We wanna be equitable and transparent. And also we want to ensure that we are fiscally responsible. And um, council member Darling, when you mentioned that something similar is going on at MCE, um, you might want to take a look at what we just adopted last week. It might help because we did that with the assistance of a a human resources lawyer, as well as looking at all of the agencies of um, similar ilk in the Bay Area, as well as our own cities. And lastly, we got some clarification on the organic waste reduction um, legislation that we heard about at our last meeting. And it was stated at the last meeting that Recycle Smart was applying on behalf of the whole, all six agencies that are members of Recycle Smart for the grants that are coming from CalRecycle. And in fact, it turned out 
that there was a little quirk in the, the rules because the county isn't full agency in the JPA. So all of the member agencies had to apply separately. And I really wanna commend our public works staff and city management team for picking that up and running with it and getting that grant application in because I think it means something on the order of $70,000 to the city, which will be compiled with the other agencies within Recycle Smart on organic waste reduction programs. And lastly, I would mention that Tuesday, February 15th, the Chamber Civic Affairs Committee will have its Civic Affairs Forum. It's at 9 a.m. It is a webinar, and it's the title of it is State of the State. It is not a presentation by the governor. It is a presentation by the Executive Vice President of the California Chamber of Commerce on the business perspective, and it is uh, joining him on that will be the executive director of the League of California Cities, Carolyn Coleman, who will give the city perspective on that. And again, that's it from 9 to 10 a.m. on Tuesday, February 15th. And you can get more information about that at the Chamber's website, which is walnut-creek.com. And I think that um, covers everything I've been doing. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Uh, You've all been busy. Thank you for what you're doing for the city. I had the opportunity to attend the downtown bar and restaurant owners meeting with Ms. Hemingway, Lieutenant Hibbs, Mr. Hirahara was on the call as well. And it was nice to hear firsthand some of the success stories, some of the challenges that our local restaurants and bar owners are having with the uh, rebound program. They all seem to be genu genuinely and generally excited about uh, Downtown Next and the opportunity for more outdoor dining experiences. And uh, look forward to Restaurant Week, I believe is this summer. There was some talk about a cocktail contest and I, I am available for judging anytime, any place that you ha hold that. Uh, I did that last summer and it was a lot of fun. Um, that same day, we had a Zoom uh, conference call, speaking of the organized retail theft, a follow-up meeting with the owners of Broadway Plaza. The city manager, the police chief, and myself were on that call talking about efforts that we can collaborate going forward in the future on if, ranging from legislative fixes to road closures to better communications between overtime staff from the police department, the Nordstrom store, Apple, all of our downtown retailers. So I want uh, the community to know that those conversations have not stopped, they're ongoing. The city is committed to being a safe destination for everyone who lives, works, or visits here. On, I attended the Recycle Smart board, board meeting along with uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. She gave an excellent report on that. So I'm gonna defer to her report on that. I had the pleasure of attending my first ribbon cutting at the El Charo restaurant uh, last Thursday night, which was a lot of fun. The scissors were huge and uh, just good, good fun environment. Um, great to see that, you know, legendary restaurant of the East Bay has a new home in Walnut Creek and gl glad, glad that they're here. I also got the opportunity to tape my first mayor's monthly update. I wanted to thank former Mayor Wilk for starting that tradition and also, oh, no, I think it was Council Member Haskey who started that tradition. <laughs> and I want to thank her. Forget <laughs> Council Member Wilkes not here, so forget him. Um, but it was fun to do that. I want to thank our communications director, uh, Betsy Burkhart, and uh, Matt Bolander from Walnut Creek TV for you know all the great, uh, tremendous resource on that. I attended uh, as the liaison to sister cities. Walnut Creek has two sister cities in Sheafolk, Hungary, and Nocetto, Italy, the program which allows our middle school students to travel abroad to those two cities and for students of the same age to come visit us had been suspended because of COVID for the past two years. But they're about to relaunch and they're excited about it. Uh, I need to send some letters to those mayors and practice my translation skills to uh, invite them to, to join us in getting that kicked off for this next year, uh, 2022 to 2023. And finally, Last but not least, I also had the pleasure of attending uh, the Arrow of Light Weebelows 2 Cub Scout Den from PAC 302, which was the den 
that I was den leader of and that my son was a member of. And uh, so that was in your neighborhood, Council Member Darling, uh, two weekends ago. And the young men in that picture are Jordan and Drew uh, Provence, Scott Haga, Luke Ma Matheson, Theo Yacht, and Jack Heinz. And so I got to tell them about what we do at the council and what it means to be a good citizen and to follow the rule of law. And I want to especially give a shout out to their two uh, den leaders who are uh, Drew Provence and, and Jack Heinz, the taller gentleman in the back, the ones with hair, I'm the one without hair, um, who are Boy Scouts, close to Eagle Scouts, who volunteer their time for this den and kind of help the boys, you know, with questions that they could ask me. It was a pretty engaging conversation and I was impressed by their level of commitment and I even made a promise that if they, uh, if they go on to Boy Scouts and get their Eagle Scout, I'll be at their ceremony. So that was a fun event, and that concludes my uh, that concludes my report. So now we'll move on to the portion of the agenda consideration items. This is the next item on the agenda will be selection of applicants to be interviewed for consideration for 2022 commission appointments. At this time, I'd invite the city clerk to provide the staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Susie Martinez, City Clerk. Just have a brief report. So this biennial recruitment process, we had eight openings, one opening each on the design review, park recreation and open space, planning and transportation commissions, two openings on the Arts Commission, and one opening for a Walnut Creek representative on the Central Contra Costa Transit Authority, Advisory Committee, and the Library Commission. Included in the agenda packet is a listing of all qualified candidates. Additionally, the City Council received the applications for review. I will note one correction to the staff report to note that we received 11 applications each for the Arts Commission and Pros Commission. So at this point in time, it's council standard practice to ballot and select who they would like to interview at the, meet, at our, at the next council meeting on February 15th. In the past, the council has set a standard of interviewing three candidates per opening. So in front of you at the dais, there are ballots. So if you'd like to ballot at this time or provide other direction, the choices are to interview all, interview a select few, or provide direction to go back and reopen recruitment and try to find additional qualified candidates, or a hybrid alternative as you see fit. Um, additionally, I'm seeking any guidance on the interview format for the 15th. Mayor, may I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, seeing that for a number of these commissions or um, countywide seats, there are two or three applicants, I would like to make a motion that we interview the three applicants for Transportation Commission, the two applicants for the Design Review Commission, and the two applicants for the County's Library Commission and forego balloting. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. Mayor Francois? Aye. Council Member Darling? Aye. And Council Member Haskew? Aye. Um, so before we uh, get on to balloting, uh, can you remind me we have, we have two openings on the Arts Commission? Correct. There are two openings for the Arts Commission and then one opening each on the, on the remaining commissions. I had a quick question. Does that two openings, does that include the expected resignation that we're having, we're going to see later this spring? Um, no, that is for, we have a vacancy um, formerly filled by Fritz Bruner and then um, Jane Emanuel C is. Um, okay. Term. All right. Thank you. And let's see. So then if, yes, council member has we, to. We, we do, um, of the people we interview though, we come, we we have a process whereby we have a list for if somebody else can't complete their term, that the person on that list could be contacted to take their place. Is that not true? Yes. Um, with in this process of interviewing, we can also establish an eligibility list for future um, vacancies. I think that would be helpful. It's and, and it may, may mean that we want to uh, maybe expand the interview process just a touch. Beyond six? 
for arts? Yes. Or no. Yes. Yes, let's just say yes. <laughs> so I'd make a motion that we interview six or seven for arts, three or four for planning, three or four for prose. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Aye. Mayor Francois. Yes. Councilmember Darling. Aye. And Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Motion carries. So I think we have the procedure for the balloting done now. Uh, why don't we take public comment before we ballot and then we can maybe provide further feedback on the interview process after that. So I have a script. Let's see. If any member of the public wishes to provide public comments on this item, and again, this is item 5B, selection of applicants to be interviewed for consideration for the 2022 commission appointments. Please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks and the Zoom feed will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, group spokespersons, group spokespersons are allotted 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on the item. We trust that everyone will follow the rules. This time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. I see Mr. Bennett. Welcome. Greetings again. My name's Pete Bennett. Um, the selection process. I've watched this for 44 years not just here, but throughout the county. I have public officials that I've known for years that have, I consider died suspiciously. And there is a lot of old business in this town. And what I've noticed is the club where everybody's clustered together and the decisions are made like some kind of unibody car. And I'm going to emphasize that I was an applicant for city council in 2014. And I attempted to file my nomination papers. And I was chased out of city hall by police officers denying me access to the building. I see the election process as a rather futile process and appointments, and it's a club. And you gotta break the back of that story. I've gone through too much in this county. My very first ticket here in Walnut Creek was 1978, right down the street, and it was baloney. And it just, they've just kept coming for decades. Most of you don't know this, but I had $20,000 of fines by one judge on two tickets, which is literally impossible. Destroyed my business, and when I attempted to do all that here, I even tried to become part of the program. Instead, I almost ended up in handcuffs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Any other members in the audience would like to address the council on... Commissioner interviews. How about Zoom, Susie? Um, we have no speakers on Zoom. All right, then we'll close the public comment and we will ballot. Do we, should we take a recess while we ballot or? If you could ballot and then. Okay. We can. Yes, and, and, and balloting is just putting a check Mm -hmm. By the name? Okay. Make sure you sign it so I know. Okay. <laughs> just for clarity, too, we're not or rank ordering. We're just putting a check. Got it. Thank you. And, Mayor, what we were thinking process-wise, just to add, is after you ballot, hand those to the clerk, since there may be a fair bit to, to tally, we could either take a break or we could go continue this item, move on to the legislative agenda, and then come back to this item after that. Thank you.
Susie, I have texted you my photos of my ballots. Okay, so I have everyone's ballots. Did we want to take a break or move on? You can take a quick break. Yeah. Get focused. Okay. <laughs> we'll take a, uh, how about a 10 minute recess? We'll be back at 7.30. Okay. Mayor, I would just remind you that it is 10.30 where I am. So I would, if we can, <laughs> any chance we can keep this moving um, later on, that would be great. You got it.
Okay, welcome back. We're on uh, item 5A, selection of applicants to be interviewed for consideration for the 2022 commission appointments. We've balloted and the city clerk has tabulated the ballots. Susie. Yes, so I will announce the results by commission, starting with the Arts Commission. Um, I will read all the um, votes that each individual received. So for the Arts Commission, we had five individuals who received either three or four votes. Um, four votes were received by for Jill Dresser, Janie Manuel, Renee DeWeese. Three votes were received for Suzanne Masella and Alfred Norick. And then those receiving two votes, Sarah Baltazar, Sage Loring, and Jessica Siegel. And those receiving one vote, Kevin Hu and Leslie Alperin. For the Planning Commission. I'm sorry, what was that? Did you announce the total for David Went? I didn't see that he received one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't show him receiving any votes. All right, thank you. Okay, for a planning commission, we have Two individuals that received four votes, Pamela Neating and Arvind Ramesh. Megan Haney received three votes. Receiving two votes was Kenneth Andrew Fletcher and Samantha Bahadi. And receiving no votes, um, Gab Gabrieline Contreras and Peter Contolano. And for the Park Recreation and Open Space Commission, we have um, one individual receiving four votes, Jason Cook. Two individuals receiving three votes, uh, John Bass and David Joseph Lime Cedar. We have two individuals receiving two votes, Chris Hunter, Stephen Jeffrey Melman. Two individuals receiving one vote, Therese Dixon and Brittany Humphrey. And four individuals that received no votes, Vincent James Courtney, Scott Rafferty, Radhika Servansian, and Alexi Timo Faiz. And that concludes the tally. Mayor, I'm happy to make a motion. Yes, please. Um, I move that for the Parks and Rec Recreation and Open Space Commission, we interview John Bass, Jason Cook, David Limes, Cedar, and that would be all. For Planning Commission, I move that we interview Megan Haney, Pamela Needing, and Arvind Ramesh. And I would like us to discuss the Arts Commission further. Second on the motion on uh, pros and Planning Commission. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Aye. Mayor Francois. Aye. Council Member Darling. Aye. Council Member Haskew. Aye. Motion carries. You look like you're doing some math calculations, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, if we wanted to interview eight, there were eight in total that had two, three, or four votes. That would be two panels of four. I move that we use that. You're going to have to read the names to me because I didn't run. I'm sitting right yes. next to him. Right I move here. that we interview for the Arts Commission, Sarah Baltazar, Jill Dresser, Jane Emanuel, Sage Loring, Suzanne Masella, Renee Deweese, Alfred Norick, and Jessica Siegel. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Aye. Council Member Haskew. Aye. Council Member Darling. Aye. And Mayor Francois. Aye. Motion carries. Aye. 
And then in terms of any other feedback or comments on the interview process, I, I personally thought that when we, when we interviewed folks in panels of three or four, uh, that that tended to work out pretty well and that we would have three or four questions, uh, one for each of us to ask them, kind of round robin. Any other feedback for the clerk in terms of setting up the interviews? Yes, council member. Yeah. So we have five questions. I'm joking. <laughs> I can't tell when you're joking or not. Okay, well, ha I think three to four per uh, commission is probably three or four good questions, searing questions, insightful questions. <laughs> I think we can get to um, we can get to the gist of it. With and we have 15 minutes at the beginning so that we can determine the questions. <laughs> okay. And then we will continue the recruitment for the um, Central Contra Costa Transit Authority and check in in March. Great. All right, unless there are any other comments on this item, we're going to move on to the uh, 20. Can I have one, one other question? Is If we start at four, will we have enough time given we have to do five, com five commission interviews actually a sixth for libraries and a seventh for a second paneling of arts. Likely no, but I have to calculate all the time. So I will be reaching out to you to see if, if we need to start a little bit earlier. Okay, good, good point. All right, moving on to our 2022 state legislative agenda and welcome Deputy City Manager Hanson. All right, you guys can hear me? All right. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, members of the public, Carla Hansen, Deputy City Manager. The item before you this e evening is proposed 2022 legislative agenda. Uh -huh. We're gonna do this presentation in two parts. Uh, we're gonna start off with a legislative update from our lobbyist uh, from Townsend Public Affairs, Casey Elliott, and then we'll be jumping into the 2022 proposed legislative agenda. The recommended action for you this evening is to discuss and approve the proposed 2022 legislative agenda. With that, I will hand it over to Casey Elliott, Vice President of Townsend Public Affairs. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, Casey Elliott from Townsend Public Affairs. Um, as was noted, just want to provide a quick legislative update to uh, provide a little bit of context for um, that which this legislative platform will be uh, will be considered. Um, earlier in January, the beginning of the month, the legislature returned for the second year of the two-year legislative session. Um, the focus of this. This first month has really been moving bills through the legislative process through the first house that were introduced last year but failed to move forward. Um, new legislation has until February 18th to be introduced this year. Uh, we anticipate probably a normal, what I would consider a normal bill load for um, Sacramento, which means somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 newly introduced bills um, prior to February 18th. So far we've seen about 250, 300 new bills. So the majority of new legislation is gonna be coming in the next two and a half weeks. Um, that said, I think we can anticipate a couple of major themes um, that the legislature will be considering. Uh, obviously the continued response to the, to the COVID uh, pandemic, um, both through state response, as well as some of the ancillary impacts on um, not just economic development, but um, uh, public meetings via teleconference, uh, outdoor cocktails, and just kind of all of the different ways that we've adapted to life and, and how Sacramento is going to want to have some impacts on, on how that continues. Uh, additionally, will there continue to be a focus on affordable housing, land use issues, homelessness uh, from a policy perspective? Um, this year there will be uh, anticipate a, a strong focus on public safety, um, and that is uh, in, in this context would largely be in response to things that we have seen, such as the organized theft rings, the increases of um, some of the, the nonviolent and violent crimes throughout the state. So I think when we're talking public safety legislation, uh, more, more kind of nuts and bolts public safety than 
um, than some of the systemic issues that we've seen being addressed in Sacramento in recent years. I think we'll continue to see legislation related to uh, drought and wildfire uh, response, prevention, uh, mitigation, both in funding as well on a policy side. The drought will likely be some new elements, whereas on the wildfire, I think we're gonna continue to see some uh, legislation that helps uh, speed up uh, preparation, uh, dealing with forest management, uh, as well as the urban and uh, wildland interfaces. And then lastly, I think there's gonna be a strong focus on transportation, including supply chain resiliency. Obviously, a lot of consumers have been impacted by the congestions we've seen at the ports. Um, but also the legislature, as I'll talk, touch on in just a minute, did not pass a transportation tr budget trailer bill last year, so there's additional funding work that needs to be happen happening. Uh, all of this is gonna be taking place in Sacramento in not only an election year, but in a new redistricting year. We've already seen the impacts from that um, to date. Um, so far, uh, we have currently, as of today, we have five vacancies in the state legislature uh, yesterday. Uh, Assemblymember Autumn Burke out of Los Angeles announced her uh, resignation, or, or, uh, which was effective today. Um, there's another 15 members have, that have indicated they are not intending to rerun for their current seats, which they were otherwise be eligible to do. Uh, and this is gonna have an impact not just on the, the political side, which we all like talking about, but uh, on the policy changes. We've already seen changes in ch committee chairmanships on the Appropriations Committee, the Housing Committee, uh, the Government Finance Committee with Ms. Burke's um, uh, departure, the Assembly Revenue and Taxation Committee will need a new chair. So we're gonna have a lot of new people overseeing some major policy areas. Um, so all, all, all of, <laughs> there's gonna be some learning on the job. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just put it that way. Um, the other focus for the first month of, of session and will continue through um, through June has been the governor's, uh, governor's January budget proposal, which was released on, on January 10th. Just some high level, uh, big picture of, of the budget. It proposes $213 billion in state general fund spending, uh, which is about 1.5% year over year increase. Um, the big top line, which you, you probably read, was it contains a $45.7 billion projected budget surplus. Uh, just a little about 20.6 20, 20 billion of that was, would be what we would consider discretionary. Um, and then the budget uh, continues to build on the state reserves would, would result in about a $20 billion rainy day, state rainy day fund, as well as another $9.7 uh, billion additional res, um, reserve for educational purposes. On the revenue numbers, though, I would note the Department of Finance, uh, they had to make their revenue calculations in late November, so the full impact of Omicron that's happened on uh, California's economy is not factored into the governor's budget. So it's anticipated that with the May revise, we will see some shifts in these numbers. Um, just a couple of key areas I wanted to highlight for you. Um, again, I won't get into the details, but uh, significant funding, three and a half billion over two years for COVID response. Um, that will likely be in the budget year as well as in, in the current year. Um, so a lot of that is for testing, vaccination rollout. And then there's a new proposal that uh, the legislature and the uh, governor have agreed to, it isn't in print yet, but is uh, significant funding for uh, extending COVID leave for those businesses with, I believe it's 26 or more employees. Um, so we can see those types of proposals being uh, moving through the budget. Public safety, um, as the governor noted in December, he followed through with his pledge to include funding within, this, within his proposed budget, uh, most notably a $255 million pot for competitive grants for local governments. Um, to help uh, particularly with retail crime rings. Uh, that would be a presumably a multi-year, a multi-round, multi-year phasing. And then an additional $30 million for district attorneys to help um, prosecute and combat those, those same crimes. Um, on housing and homelessness, we see a continued investment from this administration with two billion for housing as well as an additional two billion for homelessness from the administration. Um, this builds on some of the multi-year efforts that have been done in previous budgets. Um, significant resources the governor is proposing to expend for, sus you know, for sustainable housing through infill infrastructure, so through sustainable communities. The administration is really putting a focus on development of downtowns. Um, the governor views housing in this year's budget as part of a, a, a climate resiliency, a climate action plan. So really viewing housing from a climate impact lens as well. Um, on the homelessness side, uh, proposing a billion and a half for shelters and treatment of homeless individuals, which would be in addition to the multi-year funding um, that was contained as part of last year's budget. 
as well as $500 million for encampment cleanup efforts. Uh, last year, there was about 50 million included for that, and there's been a, a, a lot of expressed desire for that program, so the administration is, is you know, proposing significantly more resources for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, last year there was not a budget transportation trailer bill, um, so the governor uh, continued to propose essentially uh, last year's budget trailer bill, uh, which contained $4.2 billion for high-speed rail, significant funding for uh, rail and transit projects, over a billion dollars for local projects, um, $750 million for bicycle and ped, and then also he has some significant uh, investments over five years for the deployment of zero emission vehicles, kind of across from bus fleets to, uh, to off-road cargo handling equipment. Should also note within the governor's budget trailer proposal, um, it would be a proposal to suspend the uh, inflationary rate adjustment for, um, for the gas taxes that were passed, which would thereby decrease the amount of funding that would be provided to local governments through local streets and roads funding. Um, so that is part of that overall process. Um, additionally, there's significant funding for climate crisis, which includes forest health and drought, as was noted before. And then lastly, I wanted to point out some of the small business investments, which is part of the COVID response. Um, some of that is going to be a buy down of, of UI and um, the UI debt that's accre accrued, but also continuing to help those businesses that have been most impacted by the COVID pandemic, including you know shuttered venues, restaurants, and other small businesses. Um, the legislature has begun to meet on these um, the governor's January budget already. Those committee hearings will likely continue through March. Then there'll be a, probably a little low before the May revise is introduced in mid-May, and then, and then we go into the final sprint before June 15th. Um, but as I noted, the May revise will be significant so that the legislature can really get that good a target on what the actual surplus number is going to be in the overall revenue amount, which is probably why we'll see a little bit less budget activity early on this year. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, about budget or politi policy items that are pending in Sacramento. Thank you, and it's a good kind of problem to have, to have <laughs> a billion here and a billion there. Um, one of the things when we were doing the A3 process looking at mental health response, one of the things that was noted was that there wasn't a good place to take people, um, either sobering centers or something other than a mental health ER visit. Is the homeless, any of the homeless funding going to be something that could be used for something like that, or are they strictly looking at shelters and hotel conversions? I would say potentially, and I, and I say potentially because at this point of the budget process, not a lot of the trailer bill language and the details have been fleshed out. Um, I think from the administration's perspective, they feel that they've invested significant dollars in, in shelters and you know kind of the, the, the actual facilities, and now they wanna make sure that they're addressing uh, some of the issues that are impacting the homelessness or you know, those of, at risk of becoming homeless. So I think that we're gonna see a, a, a more comprehensive proposal coming from the administration as opposed to just shelters and beds. But at this point, we don't, we don't have exactly all of those details quite yet. Okay, and then on the drought response, I saw that the um, initiative, the um, uh, citizen initiative relative to storage is di dying or dead, is there? Yeah, correct, the, the earlier, this week or late last week, I forget which, the proponents essentially- Said we're out of time. Yeah, said, said we're, we're running out of time and, and, and money. And so uh, while there's still time to collect signatures, there's really not a, a financial backing behind it at this point. So that's gonna make it, I would say, pretty much done. Okay, those are my questions, thanks. Council Member Haskew. I'm gonna ask a, a big question. Like, sure. are, they, are they gonna do anything more about building housing stock in, this, in the state? Um, it's a tricky question to answer. There will definitely be bills that are aimed at increasing the housing stock in California, whether or not, you know, kind of what those look like at this point. Um, I think from the administration standpoint, at least what's reflected in their January budget is a lot of investment in the existing funding programs as, create, as opposed to creating new programs to funnel hundreds of millions of dollars into. Um, I think on the policy side, we will see 
something. I, I don't know quite what it is. We don't, I would say so far this year, we haven't quite seen the, you know, the SB 35 proposal or the SB 9s and 10s kind of materialize. Um, I, I think that we will be seeing those in the next couple of weeks that are, that are aimed at creating housing. But a, as we know with many of these bills, I think the intention and then the practical implication once they, if they become law, can, can sometimes be disjointed. And, and I'm sure you know that there is a movement in the state to have a proposition that undoes some of the work that, that they've done already. Um, any feeling about how that's going to affect anything? So there's a, a couple of propositions that are trying to qualify for the November ballot that would definitely impact local governments. There's the local control initiative, which would essentially allow local jurisdictions, if they pass ordinances, that those would supersede state law, essentially as it relates to land use decisions. Um, so that's in, in the mix and proponents are gathering signatures. Um, I, I would say it's, it's a really expensive year to try to put things on the ballot. So um, I don't wanna say it can or can't be done, but um, there's a lot of grassroots efforts going on, but there's still probably gonna need to be some significant financial backing behind that um, in order to qualify. And then there's also some a, uh, a taxpayer protection initiative that's making its way through. Um, through well, I don't think it's been given the title and summary quite yet, but it will be hitting the streets. And that would really restrict the ability of local governments and, and the state government to increase, uh, impose fees and taxes. Um, so both of those are probably the two key initiatives that we're looking at. Um, all the initiatives must qualify uh, prior to June 30th, so we'd really be looking for signatures to be turned in in April. Um, so that's that's kind of the time frame on those measures. Mayor Pro Tem Silva, any questions of Mr. Elliott? Now I'm sitting here at my desk in D.C. preparing remarks for meetings tomorrow with um, the administration departments and some legislators. So <laughs> drought, infrastructure, money more build back better it's all very relevant i imagine and uh, you had mentioned mr elliott that there were some uh l legislators that had decided not to run for re-election any uh, any of our local legislators are affected by that or no yeah at the end at the end of the year assembly member jim frazier uh who represented uh east county and then kind of up into solano county uh he resigned his seat so um, that special election, the, I know the runoff is consolidated with June, I believe it's an ap early April uh, election date. Um, and then in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, you had Assembly Member Chu, who stepped down to be the San Francisco Disc District Attorney. That election is coming up, I believe later this month. Um, so a couple in the Bay Area, uh, but again, a couple, you know, three or four in Southern California as well. All right, well, thank you. We'll turn it back then to Deputy City Manager Hanson. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Moving on to the second part of our presentation, we're gonna jump into the proposed 2022 legislative agenda. So every year the council approves an agenda and it, this serves as our um, advocacy framework for legislative initiatives, legislative bills for in Sacramento. Um, our legislative agenda is really um, a document that is a statement of values and um, a document that helps our Walnut Creek representatives and others in Sacramento really understand what Walnut Creek is, is interested in um, when it comes to legislation. Um, it is divided into two parts, um, both very broad and high level and vo both very focused. And um, this really allows the city to be nimble because as we saw with, with Casey's presentation, there are a variety, numerous and a variety of types of bills that um, we react to every year. And so this legislative agenda has both high level areas and very specific public policy areas um, that allow us to um, lobby on those efforts. Um, so the legislative committee, which is the mayor and mayor pro tem and staff review the proposed agenda every year and suggest changes for the city council to review and approve. This year, uh, the major proposed change is a removal of the housing policy framework, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, and a majority of the other proposed changes are really reprioritizing other public, public policy positions, uh, merging some policy language for, for clarity, um, and then just editorial edits um, and to clarify specificity. 
So I'm going to walk through each of the sections of our legislative agenda and show you some higher level edits. I won't go through each, um, each edit just because for time and brevity, um, but if it's okay with you, Mayor, to pause after each section so we can discuss um, and answer any questions. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Awesome. So the main section, and this is the highest level section of our legislative agenda, is our, our legislative principles. And this is really a statement of values uh, from the city. And a number of edits that are included here are really broadening um, the language to include the community. Um, so employees, employers, and visitors, um, not just visit businesses and residents, because the, as we know, the city serves a lot more than just residents and businesses. Um, the other edit here is um, striking out um, environmental initiatives. And this doesn't mean that we're taking out envir environmental initiatives from our statement of values here, because as you can see in the third section, it is very focused on environmental protection, resource conservation. So to avoid redundancy, we, uh, the legislative committee uh, suggested taking out environmental from the second as it's included in the first or the, in the third um, section. No other edits to this section. And I'll pause there. Council Member Haskew. Yep. Um, when I read the additions, I am actually happy with the additions. Um, I'm not so happy with um, the um, businesses, because what are businesses but employers and employees? Um, it was all I could hear in Sesame Street was, here are five things, what doesn't belong with them, and businesses didn't. So I would uh, suggest that we delete the word businesses because we got it all with people, and I think that means a lot more. I agree. One of these things doesn't belong here. Yeah. Can you guess which one doesn't I belong did. here? I you pointed did. it out. I, I think we've covered that with employers and employees. Thank you. Any other comments on general legislative principles? Nope. So this next section is jumping into our policy, public policy positions, and this is the more specific areas um, and specific language. So this section includes uh, policy areas around general public safety, non-law enforcement responses to mental health calls, funding for peace officer training and standards, and cannabis. Uh, the proposed changes here, as you can see in red on your screen, are adding language for organized retail theft um, and increased funding to, um, to mitigate and prevent these types of crimes. The other changes in this section that aren't highlighted on the, on the slide here are really reprioritizing some public policy positions, what order they're in, and merging um, the three different cannabis policy statements into one statement. And I will pause there. I'm noticing just a typo, uh, just should be justice, I believe, in that first line. Any other uh, questions, comments? Council Member Darling. I've always struggled with that first bullet. I mean, don't we want to adjust penalties for property crimes to effectively deter them rather? I'm, I've always been uncomfortable with reversing propositions that people voted on, but I, that's just, I don't have good language that changes that, and that's been there for a long time, but. I mean, if you'd like, we could uh, work on drafting something that's a little broader, that's not as narrowly focused on prior proposition language, but something that's a little broader to address um, penalties for some types of property crimes. Any other comments on public safety? Council Member Hatch. So we, uh, um, we could just say adjust um, state laws that have lowered penalties for some property crimes. What was that language again? Adjust? Adjust the language of state laws that have lowered. I don't know that we have the jurisdiction to do that, though, if it was passed by the voters. Yeah. Uh, no, that, that you can advocate for it and you can send it back through the system, including 
Police Officer Association and the Retail Retailers Association okay. have been jockeying for propositions that would adjust some of that. Got it. Council Member Haskew. Yep. Um, when I read both sections uh, B and C, I thought a lot of the focus was redundant. Um, my suggestion is to remove section B altogether and make C the replacement B. But I also think that in the original segment B, uh, that, that there was something that really was important and should stand on its own, and that is um, the city supports efforts to provide funding for regional collaborations between local government school districts and other stakeholders to help improve youth mental health and wellness. So if I could C should be the new B with the last line of B retained? Yes, as a, as a new section, because I think it's its own unique idea. So they re replace it as a C. Got that? You follow it? Yep, got it. I'm so excited. Um, I would... I would hazard, though, that what you've done, Luella, is actually not made a public safety, that that youth mental health and wellness doesn't belong in the public safety section. I don't, might belong in a different section. I think it's important, but I... And I'm, fi I'm, I'm fine. Then get rid of the redundancy and find another section. I don't know if we really have another section. Is it, yeah, is it human resources? I'm not sure. It's not environmental sustainability. We don't have a catch-all section. Well, hold it for now. Yeah, I mean, it, it is in the public safety long. section <laughs> now, just as a separate sentence. So I, I think it should, it should live there. Okay. I thought it got lost. Any other comments on public safety? Yes. Um, I, I think that the information on um, testing of level of intoxication uh, for cannabis and driving under the influence actually doesn't, doesn't gel with the um, retail and development and the business side of cannabis. It's a, it's a you know, a different system that figures out whether you're drunk, you're in under the influence or not. And so I think that should be its own section. I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with that because when they were their own section, it looked like that's all we were worried about was cannabis. No, I, I'm not getting rid of this section. I'm just putting it in a different paragraph. I agree with you. All of the above deserves to be there. No, I didn't say get rid of it. It, it was, it was becoming a cannabis section because there were so many su little subsections. You can keep it, but I hold my position that that's, that's a different topic altogether. Different than, okay. To me, it seemed to make sense to, it, it seemed to belong there as well because they were supporting funding and legislation related to combating drug driving. It's a it's a it's a DMV situation versus a process situation. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think there's one agency now. Not, that does alcohol oh. and and I mean defines DUI. Yep. The, the three cannabis agencies, I think, have been merged. But it really doesn't matter. If the question is if the policy is there, not how many bullets we have. I think if the, if the council would like to keep it the language in and a different bullet, we can do that. Um, if the, as Mayor Pro Tem Silva said, it's more of the policy intent here. Um, we can we can fuss around with the formatting. Are you okay with separate yeah. bullets? Okay. Yeah. I want separate. Okay. Yeah. That's all I want. 
I'll just throw this out. To me, the first two sentences read like they should be in economic development. That's how we treat it in our priorities. And the last two sentences should be in public safety. Agreed. I can live with that. I'm going to bed. Hurry up, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Housing and homelessness. I have one. Yes. Okay, the city supports, this is item F, the city supports new state and federal programs that provide funding and financing for affordable housing at all income levels. And I, I the first thing that popped into my mind was really higher income people need affordable housing, they can flip and afford anything they want. Can we say something to the equivalent, especially we support housing, but we are especially interested in, in the other groups, the ones we listed, middle. Or we could just take for affordable housing, period, because affordable housing comes with the definition of the income levels that are eligible for affordable housing. Peachy. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. I'm sorry, Carla. We didn't even let you present that one. That's okay. There's, oh. a, there's a momentum here. I didn't want to disturb it. Um, so major change in this uh, housing, homelessness, and land use section is the removal of the housing policy framework. Um, this framework was added as an, added as an addendum to the, um, to the legislative agenda in 2020, um, and it was written as a response to the CASA Compact um, of 2019. We have not updated this framework in two years. The information's largely out of date. Um, so what we did was really look at the, the policy intent of that document um, and made some, wanted to in, still include that in, into the legislative agenda. And these two bullets that are on your screen here, these proposed additions do capture that, really focusing on um, making sure that uh, local land use authority still retain, is still retained at the local level um, and that housing really matches the character of the community. Um, while addressing the statewide affordability and housing crisis. In addition to that, um, really looking at our regional jobs housing balance when we're looking at adding housing and jobs and focus, focusing on not one or the other, but both. I am super in favor of that removal. Council Member Darling. This makes me happy. Excellent, <laughs> we're happy. Go. Right. Transportation and infrastructure. Oops, sorry about that. So this section has a lot to it. Um, it contains variety of policy positions on funding for aging and out of date facilities that need replacement, supporting legisla legislation that requires more monitor monitoring and safety of fuel and gas pipelines increased funding for um, and rehab of re routes of regional significance um, and meeting mandates of the Clean Water Act. The addition here that was proposed is um, legislation that would provide funding for cities and local governments to install fiber infrastructure. And the other edits are um, minor in nature. The only, the only one that caught my eye this next round through was an F the second sentence, I would propose we re reword that to say this, this requirement is unachievable without extensive state and federal financial resources. I'm looking at the red line, I can't read it. That has to do with the Federal the Clean, Clean Water Act. Act. I was like, which F? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. The, I'm looking at the clean version. Got it. 3F. I'm not sure Public Works would agree with that edit, Matt. We need to ask them. Yeah, I was going to suggest I think there's two issues here. One is that regardless of funding, it may not be attain <coughs> attainable the way it's currently written, uh, hence this last sentence in that section about okay. modifying the goal so that we get some existing credits because without those credits, it's likely not attainable. All right, so that was intentional, that it, we, we think that that law is unachievable and it requires a lot of money that we don't have. Yeah. Okay. Then I withdraw my 
Amendment. Environmental sustainability. So the major proposed addition here is uh, supporting funding for recycled water infrastructure in collaboration with local utility districts um, and really planning for increased uh, drought scenarios with the um, inevitability of climate change. Councilmember Darling. Um, sorry, the inner water wonk in me came out. If you're gonna talk about getting water for recycling without including conservation, that will look funny and some will, somebody will ask us if we don't support conservation. So I would suggest that that one be edited to say you know, water conservation and recycle water infrastructure because water conservation is likely to be part of our sustainability action plan. My other comment here has to do with something that's come up at MCE and is going in front of the CPUC right now, which is the um, net energy metering and the changes in rooftop solar. And I don't know, I should ask Casey when is up here, if that is going to come to legislation this year or not. The CPUC is supposed to be coming up with regulations this month, but whether or not it goes forward, um, what, what we did with MCE is just say, we want rooftop solar to continue forward. Do we need to? I would, I would speculate at this portion of the legislative session, given the interests on both sides of that <laughs> issue, that we will likely see legislation. Yeah. Which side the legislature kind of leans to on that debate, I think is probably a little uncertain right now, but I would think that we'll see something on that. And, and maybe, honestly, legislation on, on <laughs> from from each side, from the um, you know pro pro and con. So that's definitely something we can monitor and, and let you know. But I, I do think we'll probably see some legislative efforts there this year. Okay, I, I think if we address it here to give ourselves the opportunity to say something, we would want to say we support sustainable and equitable growth of rooftop solar, recognizing the changes as the industry matures, and that gives you guys lots of room. But it is something that we'll want to probably weigh in on and then the the companion piece to that is as solar has really matured the problem is we don't have enough baseline um, and that that is all being provided right now by um, natural gas and there's new energy technologies coming out that will address um, the organic waste stream and converting that into energy and so giving ourselves the possibility under g to um, support reevaluation of diversion rates and promote new energy technologies to take advantage of urban organic waste, something like that, because that's going to be part of how we get out of just having sun and not something at night because you have garbage 24 seven. I think that makes sense and dovetails with our climate action plan and sustainability plan. So. Uh, just noticed a typo in C. That's why I'm here. The city supports uh, strike the T there before state. And then uh, we'll move on to finance and human resources. My only comment is there are businesses instead of people again. So this uh, proposed addition here is really uh, still staying with the modernizing collection and distribution of sales tax, um, but getting a little bit more specific of what we mean by that and um, the effects that it does have on, on Walnut Creek. And then the other one is just making sure that um, the pandemic relief funding that is being provided by the state and federal governments um, are equity distributed throughout the state. And then a lot of the changes in this section were actually movement of language from the economic development and um, economic development and community development section into this section because it was really tax collection related and belonged in the finance section. So we're going to strike businesses in 5D and I think we're done on that. Community and economic development. All right, last section. 
Um, so this, um, this section is really focused on, obviously, economic development, funding for um, supporting different sectors, um, and really focusing on preserving commercial zoning um, while achieving a house housing and jobs balance. The addition here is um, adding life sciences to the uh, variety of sectors that we're looking for funding for um, through the economic development funding opportunities. So I have one technical I, grammatical. The word businesses belongs all the way at the end because every one of those clean tech, communication technology are AI, biomed research, and life sciences are all businesses. And may I may I say that to list everything as if it's a finite list might leave out something that we don't think about that would be ideal for Walnut Creek. So can we put in a phrase like such as or for example so that we have the opportunity to bite onto something that looks like it deserves some attention? In the next year? Yeah, like all of these are going to happen in the next year. <laughs> I think that's a good suggestion. Okay. Uh, let's see, take us home, Carla. That, and I do want to have public comment on this as well. Okay. Yes, Councilmember Haskew. I, I noticed that, and I understand why we deleted the thing on TOT, uh, because there was proposed legislation where the state was going to systemize it. Um, we still have the problem of uncollected TOT. So is there any value in saying something like we um, would like to have the state require that all um, providers of um, short-term re rentals or whatever the technical term is, um, let the cities know when there is a property within the city boundaries and county boundaries so that we know who to collect the tax from? Isn't it, Luella, isn't it in the fine, section 5C? Is there? Yeah. I think we just moved it. Yeah, we moved it to 5C. Oh, okay. Sorry, I couldn't find it. Thank you. So reminding you of your recommended action this evening and offering a suggestion that we did a lot of wordsmithing here this evening and we'll put it together as staff and then maybe giving it back to the ledge committee for one last review before finalizing um, if that's okay with the council i i move that we accept the oh we gotta take a comment, comment. Yeah. You can when it's time. i'm gonna go to you first on the motion i swear let's see so this is the time for public comment on our 2022 state legislative agenda if you're here in person, which I don't see anybody but staff here. So we'll go to Zoom. If you'd like to address us on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only and you'd like to make a comment on the 2022 legislative agenda. We have no hands raised on Zoom. I want to make a motion that we accept. <laughs> I've closed the public comment period and I'm <laughs> Entertaining a motion. Okay. That we accept the proposed legislative principles with the amendments that were discussed uh, today and bring the revised version back to the Ledge Committee for approval. And I will second that motion. Clarification, are you giving the Ledge Committee the ability to approve as long as it meets what has been discussed tonight? I thought I had. Okay. Well, that's that's. I just want to understand the intent. Councilmember Haskew, aye. Councilmember Darling, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Silva, aye. Mayor Francois, aye. Motion carries. Thank you, guys. Okay. Let's see. Where are we? We are in our third consideration item: City Council 2021-2022 Priorities Plan Update. I see Ms. Bruner is going to kick things off. Yeah, let me, if I could, real quick, uh, introduce this item. Dan Buckshy, City Manager, and I do want to introduce our budget manager, Katie Bruner, 
who is uh, giving this update this evening and help compile the report based on information provided from all of our departments. I just wanted to point out one of the things we've been doing at the city, as we've noted, with the wave of retirements, the, the great uh, resignation and labor shortage and our higher vacancy rate, is we have been uh, taking folks up on their offers from their various roles to help out with some major initiatives. And so I do want to acknowledge and thank uh, Katie for stepping up to to manage this project and provide this update this evening. Good evening, Mayor Francois and members of the council. I'm Katie Bruner, budget manager, and I will be providing the update on your council priorities this evening. So as you are aware, um, on March 25th, 2021, uh, your council identified five strategic priorities for the city for the calendar years 2021 and 2022. In June, staff brought forward the work plan for each priority, and we reported back with an update on the work plan and activities in September. So tonight is your second update on what has been accomplished in each priority since our last September update, and I will also preview planned activity for the next quarter. Um, I will pause after an update on each priority for questions from council. Okay. So the first priority is diversity, equity, and inclusion. With a, uh, and this priority focuses on continuing to build a welcoming and inclusive community. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Oh, thank you. We need, it's going through Zoom, so we just need to give it a a second or two. <laughs> okay, there we go. So the community-based task force is a group of highly engaged community members uh, led by the mayor and mayor pro tem. And they meet monthly. Um, they have developed their mission and vision statements this over the last quarter and are working on developing recommendations on how to continue building an inclusive community to the city council. The key inputs for the task force recommendations um, include a planned community survey, which is anticipated to be released this spring, the report and recommendations from the community listen listening sessions, which were completed last year, and the lived experiences of the task force members. The internal DEI working group, also known as Team Rising Tide, was established last June with 12 staff members across all departments and levels in the organization. The Team Rising Tide is establishing a strong foundation for the important work of making meaningful structural change to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within the city. Extensive training with um, our training consultant, Circle Up Education, is underway and will continue over the next few months. With regards to training, the city has contracted with city Circle Up Education um, and uh, with the input of the internal DEI working group, staff surveys are being finalized, which will help inform the staff trainings, which are scheduled to begin uh, in the upcoming months. And so I will now pause for questions. Any questions of Ms. Bruner? Just for clarification, it's, it's myself and Council Member Wilk who serve okay. on the DEI task force. We were the former Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem. Excuse me, my apologies. Thank you, Silva Silva. Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. That was what I was going to do, was remove myself from taking credit for something I'm not doing. Okay. So the next priority is um, economic development and the COVID-19 recovery. I'm sorry, we're having little bit of a lag on the presentation here. Um, this priority has four components, economic development, downtown support and management, the blueprint and development services streamlining, and short-term rental and cannabis regulations. But under economic development, the rebound program was extended through June 2022, and the economic development community community development and public works continue to, to work with businesses on this, on the rebound program. The economic development division is working with the California Office of Business and Economic Development, the site selection community and industry consultants on the development of a retail strategy and office property study 
to further understand to further our understanding of the opportunities for business growth and expansion based on industry industry trends. The office property study was launched last fall and is expected to complete it this March. And the retail strategy is expected to be completed later this spring. Additionally, an economic dashboard uh, is being developed, which will be using updated data from the 2020 census and will also be completed early this year. For downtown city teams continue to work with downtown businesses, property owners, and key stakeholders on the downtown next initiative. Staff has been, staff completed community and citywide surveys to downtown businesses and property owners, and also received uh, feedback on specific options related to outdoor dining, parking, traffic circulation, and the general use of public space. On January 18th, your council received a staff update and per staff presented various options regarding permanent structures in the right of way um, and downtown traffic circulation. Your council directed staff to refine concepts for structures with roofs and without roofs to keep downtown traffic circulation as is. Staff will be returning to city council with refined concepts with the goal of finalizing the approach and developing a comprehensive outdoor dining, dining policy uh, with the goal of implementation in June 2022 to coincide with the targeted end of the rebound program. With regards to blueprint and development services streamlining, the blueprint for success was approved by your council in September 2019. And those specific, many of those strategies have been completed and incorporated into ongoing processes in the community development department and with the development services team. So the current staff focus is on customer service, improvements to digital services, and improved communication with, with the goal of making permitting processes more understandable and predictable for the public. And last, um, with regards to short-term rentals, staff was monitoring SB 555, which was legislation related to the collection of transient occupancy tax for short-term rentals. This bill did not move forward in the 2021 legislative cycle, but staff are continuing to monitor the upcoming legislation for either a reintroduction of SB 555 or similar bills. Additionally, we are currently exploring an opportunity for a consultant to facilitate the collection of short-term rentals, uh, transient occupancy tax, and we'll come back to council by this summer. And with regards to cannabis regulations, staff provided an analysis of commercial cannabis regulations and operations to your council in October. Council directed us to move forward exploring cannabis regulations, allowing for adult use delivery and staff is working on bringing an updated cannabis ordinance for planning, consider, planning commission consideration this February and plans to bring the draft ordinance and an updated cannabis business selection process to your council in March. And I'll pause for questions. Questions on economic development and COVID recovery. Council member Darling. Thank you. And it's quite a bit of stuff going on on the blueprint. Um, and the streamlining. It sounds like the consultant has been selected to do the permit streamlining process part, but that is now been put off until the new community services director is. Correct. The more formal process with the consultant, it has been slowed until we get a permanent community development director. Is there any sense, because the communications part of that is going to be very important and I know we're ha we're struggling with some permitting issues. Is there anything that we can do more formally on the communications part in the meantime while we're waiting for that? Yeah, I can speak to that one. It's a good question. We just had a meeting on this this morning actually. So one of the things we've been doing, we have our communications team who's been spearheading the update to overall website and they've taken a, a, a thorough conducted a thorough analysis of our website, particularly focusing on development services and permitting. And what we're looking to do is highlighting and identifying the higher volume processes that hit more folks to update the information on the website to make it easier and more streamlined. In fact, 
there were a few examples we ran through this morning. We went from about eight pages of information to one with additional links that really simplified the process. So that is in the works. And the reason we're focusing on this, just to, to highlight, I know I think I've shared with all of you individually, but for the public as well, is prior to the pandemic on our development services counter on the second floor, we were averaging over 50 in-person visits a day. That's down to about five uh, on that floor. Uh, even since we reopened uh, on January on June 15th, uh, part of reopening through the pandemic process, folks are only coming in intermittently. It means they're they're continuing, and the volume has not dropped as to folks are using online services. So really. We're trying to shift our focus to exactly what you noted, how we can communicate more clearly, make our digital presence uh, more easy to understand and, and user friendly, and at the same time, keep our eye on some of these business process improvements that we want to make longer term. It, as you go through that process, you know, I think that will really help people. Is there going to be a function on there? So if somebody's really stuck, they can, you know, phone a friend, uh, you know, is there a, a way to get a dispute resolution or um, yes. problems with time resolution? Yes, I mean, that does exist now, but I don't think it's as clear as it could be. We're also looking, actually, for more interaction on the web for folks who want to have a chat session with folks through the chat feature on the, on the web, in addition to being able to talk to somebody live. Okay, thank you. Good questions, Council Member Haskew. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem? All right. Okay, moving on to environmental, environmental sustainability and climate action. So uh, the sustainability action plan is being developed in three phases, and uh, we are currently in phase two, the policy and strategy development. So um, there have been three greenhouse gas reduction strat strategies identified and draft strategies needed to reach them. Um, staff is conducting or additional analysis regarding the implementation costs and additional community outreach um, still needs to be completed before returning to council this summer. Um, staff is also preparing a climate emergency resolution for council consideration, which will, which will be brought forward um, in conjunction with the phase two report. Um, additionally, your council approved additional funding for a consultant to keep the work on the sustainable, sustainability action plan moving forward. And that's one slide for questions. Questions on environmental sustainability. Council Member Darling. That's not a question, but it's you, this is a an area that we've been struggling with, and I recognize that. But I just want to say it is an important thing, and we do need to. Um, we've let our timeline slip quite a bit here, and I understand completely why. But uh, we have. A, number of people in the public who are waiting for this. So that was just my sad face comment. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, just following up on that, is it, um, in terms of timing, are, are, do, do we think realistically we'll be in a position to adopt a final plan by this, this year? Yes, that is the goal. We are planning to come back to your, your council this summer with options for what target to set ultimately, and really where the work is focused now. There's been a lot of detailed analyses done on different strategies and what would be involved, and we need to step that up a level so that when we bring different targets for your council's consideration, we also share what would be involved to achieve each of those targets as they are more aggressive or less aggressive, depending which target, and what the impact is, uh, whether it would be to city operations, city budget, to homeowners, to businesses, who, who bears some of the, the burden, if you will, whether it's from a cost or regulatory perspective, so we can make good trade-offs. And then once we have that, we'll really move into the implementation phase. Okay, good. Any, any questions, any further questions on that? And Mayor, yeah. um, for the city manager, is it safe to say we, we want to ensure on the sustainability plan that we don't do what the uh, water quality board has tried to do to the whole Bay Area, which makes completely unachievable objectives at a high price? Uh, yes, we would definitely like to avoid that. <laughs> okay. 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 So the infrastructure and facilities priority has been um, 
focused on the Your Parks, Your Future initiative, which began in the spring of 2018 um, and is de was designed as a two-phase project. Phase one was focused on arts and recreation programming and future facilities um, and was concluded in February 2020 with direction from your council um, on the future facilities to focus on. Phase two, the parks master planning for Heather, pa Heather Farm and Civic Park has, is currently on hold. The phase one implementation work plan is focusing on the aging and outdated swim center and community center at Heather Farm Park. So back in July, your council um, identified the project study area. And then in December, staff returned to your council with options for a future location of the combined swim center and community center. Council selected the ex site of the existing Feather Heather Farm Community Center um, for the future facility. Preliminary conceptual design work is underway and um, input from the community and the Parks, Recreation and Open Space Commission will be sought before returning to City Council for feedback on the preliminary design. And then on, in October, the city manager presented three financing options for the replacement of the city's aging infrastructure to your council. Um, general obligation bond, parcel tax, and sales tax, along with the respective key benefits and potential downsides, along with a timeline for a community survey. Council directed staff to focus the community survey on understanding the community's priorities, um, and also a potential sales tax measure. So the city's con survey consultant, EMC Research, completed the community survey this January. The survey results are currently being analyzed and will be presented to council in the coming months. Oh, and staff um, also plans to provide council with an update on the Walnut Creek Aquatics Foundation, um, including a funding amount that can be raised for a 50 meter pool, as well as a funding plan and MOU for achieving that plan. And that will come forward this spring. I think we're all pretty well versed on this. Thank you for that update. Okay. And the uh, council priority on social wellness and public safety um, has the work plan centered around three areas, mental health crisis response and training, continuing to address homelessness and enhancing community engagement. With regards to mental health crisis response, the city initiated the effort in piloting a more comprehensive social service crisis response with the county's behavioral health division. The city manager represents the city as part of a countywide working group to support in support of this and establishment of this program. So the crisis response program has been given the name A3, which is intended to indicate that anyone in Contra Costa County can access timely and appropriate behavioral health crisis service anywhere, anytime. Um, it's been recently announced that $25 million in Measure X funds for this program were recently approved by the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors. And this funding includes $5 million in one-time funding to create the Miles Hall Crisis Call, Miles Hall Crisis Call Center. Um, this one-time funding includes renovations to the physical space, the procurement of technology, and the purchasing of vehicles to support mobile crisis response teams. Additionally, there were $20 million of ongoing funds to support 24-7 mobile behavioral health crisis response call center staff, including medical and psychiatric oversight, and licensed and peer staff to field calls, 34 mobile response teams with the goal of responding anywhere in the county within 20 minutes, and additional crisis services and alternate, alternate destinations for follow-up treatment after the crisis. And these would be intended to be alternates to the psychiatric hospital, jail, or emergency room. So this slide depicts a high level overview of the model, which is that a call for help, a need for help comes into the call center. The call is answered by a live person, with someone to talk to, and then an appropriate level of response is sent out. Finally, the intent is that there's a place to go for follow-up services beyond the current options currently available. The primary focus for A3 has been the crisis call center, which is called the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub. 
It, it will be staffed by licensed clinical staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Three levels of triage teams have been defined in order to, to respond to the call for help based upon the determination of need that's most proportioned, that's most appropriate to the proportion of the need. And as the A3 program continues to scale up, mobile crisis response teams are active and continue to, be, to do so. The pilot of the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub has been active since last August. And the technology and software of the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub is being built out. Other city initiatives regarded, regarding mental health crisis response and training. The police department has established two um, new trainings related to crisis intervention training and de-escalation. This past November, officers attended stimulator training focused on mental health related calls. And these were, uh, officers interacted with a life size video screen that um, while responding to law enforcement situ situations and provided officers an opportunity to practice de-escalation techniques in rapidly evolving situations and provided officers immediate feedback based on their decisions. Throughout 2022, Crisis intervention, de-escalation, and principled policing trainings will be held by the department. And de-escalation training will be incorporated into existing police department trainings where appropriate. And the police department is working with the Martinez and Pleasant Hill police departments um, to establish a regional crisis intervention team. This team has been operational since January 1st and the Walnut Creek Police Department provided four officers, including our two homeless outreach program officers. The Walnut Creek members are enrolled in an additional training, crisis intervention team training, which is a 40-hour course above and beyond our annual police department trainings. With regards to continuing to address homelessness, the city, your council approved funding for a full-time designated core team in the fiscal year 22 and 23 budgets. So accordingly, the core team went from half-time to full-time on July 1st. And the core team meets monthly with our police department and other city departments to discuss and address emerging issues and operations. The homeless out, outreach program or HOP was paused during the pandemic, but was reestablished in July and we, the police department has two dedicated HOP officers who are supported by the department's traffic and outreach team, team sergeant. And the police department um, is continuing to enhance community engagement through additional support and presence downtown. So in August, the police department entered into a contract with Nordstrom's for law enforcement services on an overtime basis. And this officer in the Broadway Plaza area serves as a visible deterrent to crime and performs community outreach activities in the downtown area. The weekend swing shift patrol team routinely, routinely patrols the downtown business district and provides a police presence and engages with members of the community. And in response to the November 2021 organized retail theft at Nordstrom's, the police department has increased its presence in the downtown area through overtime shifts and partnering with the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department for additional resources. Additionally, on, Dece on December 1st, your council authorized funding for increased overtime, additional officers and security cameras and other equipment to help deter future organized theft events and other crime within the downtown area and the city. The department's social media team recently added new members from all divisions of the department, and they meet quarterly for training and to discuss ways to enhance community engagement. And the department established a continuous improvement, improvement team in July um, to bring forward ideas for operational improvement and better community engagement. This past fall, this team was tasked with evaluating the current patrol deployment model to serve the community more efficiently. A new patrol, patrol model began in January based on the team's recommendation and increases flexibility in the deployment of officers to best meet the needs of the community and the department. That wraps up the 
final priority, so I'll pause again for questions. Any questions on social wellness and public safety? Council Member Darling. I'm not gonna ask any questions. I just wanted to say this is an area where you guys have done a great job. For all my long faces about permitting and sustainability, you guys have done a great job on this part of things. Two, two quick ones on the uh, A3 program. Do we have an estimate for when that might be fully operational? I know the pilot's underway now. Yeah, it's going to take some time to scale up. Um, you know, for context, right now there are two mobile crisis response teams and at full build out there would be 34. So that's going to take considerable time. But uh, what I do know is next is, is more design is occurring. The county will be allocating the Measure X funds in April and so that's when the budgets will be you know, formally created for this project. So we are anticipating considerable scale up over this summer, but one of the next piece of information and plans that we're developing on is what does that scale plan look like? Okay, good, we'll look forward to update on that. And then on the crisis intervention team, my understanding was that that was kind of a, a mutual aid agreement with other departments and is it is it essentially a 24-7 response if it's not a Walnut Creek officer, it could be a Pleasant Hill officer or a Martinez officer with, with specialized training and crisis intervention? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Great. Thank you Mayor, for that. Mayor, may I ask a question? There yes. was a slide about the training. It was about crisis intervention training. Can, Katie, can you roll back? Because I'm confused about a word on it. One more back. Is it stimulator training or is it simulator training? I think it's simulator, it simula but I looked, it is simulator. Well, but that's what you described. But stimulator would I, I would hate to have make a big I don't want to make a big deal about this, but it could also be stimulator training, but it would basically be tried to stimulate the response and then train that automatic response out of a person, like, you know, the immediate response is to do X. So I, I wasn't quite sure what this really was. Yeah, we're simulating stimulation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can clarify, Jamie Knox, police chief. Yes, this is a simulator very similar to a, a video firearm simulator, now they're um, getting more into virtual reality to create uh, realistic situations that the police officers can react to. And then whoever is proctoring it can change the scenario based on the behavior of the officer where they get instant feedback on whether or not what they're doing is working. So, so we're not using a cattle prod to no. <laughs> train behavior. No. Okay. no tasers come out or anything like that against the officer. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we're, we're through the staff presentation and uh, I'd like to open this up for public comment. If there are any members of the public that would like to make a comment on the council's priorities plan update, now would be the time to please raise your hand or press star nine if you're connecting by audio only. We have one, one hand raised on Zoom, Jan Warren. I'd like to thank the ongoing support the council has provided to our unhoused residents. I'm part of a subcommittee on the Walnut Creek Homeless Task Force working to provide better ways to find, uh, boy's late, <laughs> to address the trash and encampments. The subcommittee found a successful program that has worked in Elk Grove and I understand the city formed an interdepartmental task force to work on unhoused issues and create a priority list. As was mentioned at the last city council meeting, uh, a shortage of staff and that group has been temporarily been put on pause as far as I understand. 
Um, I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that we've reached out to the subcommittee and has reached out to the Walnut Creek Rotarians about possibly funding a pilot project. And we've double checked uh, that the Safeway offers restricted cards we could use as rewards to have the unhoused help keep their sites clean. Uh, we drafted a project description and we look forward to working with the city to improve the health benefit for all. Uh, the section says uh, priority to support new and better responses to homelessness through city programming that supports the health and well being of our residents. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, raise that up. We're kind of on hold, uh, but we don't want to be on hold. <laughs> it's a new year, a new budget year. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there and uh, uh, gratis to uh, Cindy Silva for staying up so late. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Warren, and thank you for your service on the Homeless Task Force. Do we have any other uh, members of the public that would like to address the council? No additional speakers. Okay, then we'll close the public comment, and I don't believe there's any formal action required of us on this item. So we'll receive uh, the update, and we'll move on to a public hearing. Next on the agenda is a public hearing item entitled Proposed Urgency Ordinance, extending the provisions of Ordinance Number 2212, Municipal Code Amendment to modify the land use development and tree preservation regulations in all single family residential zones as necessary to comply with the new state law, SB 9, relating to additional dwelling units and subdivisions. At this time, I'd invite Andy Smith to provide the staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll keep it brief tonight. Um, I won't repeat what you just said, actually. We are here for an extension of uh, the urgency ordinance to address SB 9 as a, a quick bit of, I was warned there's a delay with this button, but wow. Let's try it again. There we go. Um, as a, a, a quick bit of background, well, first, actually, our recommendation tonight is uh, that the council extend the uh, current interim uh, urgency ordinance. Uh, right now, we're under, operating under a 45-day uh, time limit, and so we're recommending a uh, state uh, what's available under the state law, which would be an additional 10 months and 15 days. And of course, staff will continue working on the creation of a permanent ordinance or permanent regulations uh, for the, uh, the zoning. Um, what is SB 9? It's a new state law, went into effect January 1. Uh, it modifies all of our single family zones, supersedes our local zoning ordinance. Um, and the purpose of the interim urgency ordinance is to maintain some level of local control as is possible under this new, as is still possible under the new state law. What does it do? It allows for up to four dwelling units on each single family lot, um, and it waives or reduces many of the development standards that would normally apply, things like setbacks uh, along those lines. Where does it apply? All single family zones. So you can see on that uh, small map there, the city as a whole, uh, the pink areas are all of our single family zones within the city. Um, what is contained in the urgency ordinance? Uh, this is of course the existing urgency ordinance as well as what's being recommended uh, to, move, to move ahead, to be extended. Um, basically the minimum changes necessary to our local regulations to comply with SB 9 and then also adding some additional standards as is allowed by SB 9, uh, most notably a 16 foot one story height limit for any new units built, new dwelling units built under SB 9, as well as an 800 square foot floor area limitation on those units, uh, some des uh, various design standards, objective design standards, and also protections for highly protected trees. Um, so basically large native species trees, um, a general prohibition against their uh, removal uh, for the construction of SB9 dwelling units. Um, what we are we go, uh, recommending as well, in addition to just extending the ordinance, is a few minor clarifications to the ordinance. Um, speaking first actually to those tree protections, um, adding some clarification that those tree protections also apply to urban lot splits. An urban lot split is basically a small lot or two lot subdivision that is generally allowed now for all single family lots with uh, a greatly reduced minimum lot size. And so we're recommending that the ordinance be amended such that any kind of improvements could be things like your sewer line or driveway 
any kind of improvements that are necessary as part of the subdivision um, would uh, be subject to those same restrictions with regard to the uh, construction under the drip line or removal of a highly protected tree. Likewise, um, that uh, highly protected trees not be located within the vehicular access to the uh, newly created lots. And speaking of vehicular access, we're also recommending additional clarification that basically the existing or urgency ordinance um, requires access to a public or private street for all new lots created through SB9, uh, suggesting that that be further clarified to be vehicular access. So anything from an automobile to a fire truck. And um, then uh, additionally, SB9 and our local ordinance um, generally does not apply if there's to be the alteration or demolition of any existing dwellings that have been occupied by renters within the last three years. And so we're recommending that that be clarified to explicitly say at any time within the last three years, which is of course what the requirement is under state law. And so we're recommending that that be made very clear in our local ordinance. And a couple of additional things. These are not discussed in the staff report. They are included in the errata sheet that was circulated earlier today and has been posted on our website. Um, this is actually in response to some public correspondence that we received in the last day or so, uh, recommending some additional clarification as it re relates to accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units, or ADUs and JADUs, um, and their uh, uh, relation to SB9. Specifically, in accordance with state law, uh, we wanted to clarify the local ordinance, the local regulations, that uh, ADUs and JADUs are prohibited on lots that are both have been, the lot itself has been created through one of these urban lot splits, one of these SB9 urban lot splits, and the lot has two dwelling units. So, you know, say the original house and a new one, or just two new units built under SB9. If both of those conditions are met, you cannot have an ADU or a JADU on the property. And then in all other cases, ADUs and JADUs uh, simply be uh, permitted as, is, uh, as per the normal regulations that apply citywide that we already have in force. And so we're recommending some clarifications uh, to the ordinance to address this. And the exact text has been included on that errata sheet. So again, our recommendation is that uh, the ordinance be extended um, 10 months and 15 days, and we'll continue working on the permanent regulations. Um, if needed, the city does, the city council would have the option to uh, later on, following another public hearing, grant a final one-year extension still uh, to the urgency ordinance. However, we don't anticipate needing that additional time. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any questions of staff? Thank you, Andy. Um, I just had one quick question. Um, have we had very many calls from people looking to split their lots or develop under SB9? We have received a number of, uh, 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 I, I can't give you an exact figure, but definitely a, a good number of uh, inquiries. Um, with perhaps one exception, maybe two exceptions, most of them seem to be no longer interested in moving forward given the floor area limitation and perhaps as well the 16 foot one story height limitation that's in the interim regulations. Um, but there definitely has been a lot of just general interest. I mean, this was something that, you know, was in the newspapers uh, and on TV quite a bit. So there's a higher level of public knowledge of this law than most other things that we uh, uh, work with. So we don't, you don't know if we have any that are moving forward that... There's none that have, been, that have applied for permits of okay. any sort, but there are two where I've been speaking with uh, property owners that they might go forward with it, but I don't have anything more definitive than All right, this thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Smith? Um, Mayor, yes, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Um, thank you, Andy, and thank you for um, answering my questions that I sent you um, late on Sunday, early on Monday. So uh, following up on Council Member Darling's question, is there any, the urge, okay, the urgency ordinance doesn't mean people cannot do this. It means we have basically adopted the state's ordinance at, with some minimum levels. Yes, essentially we have incorporated SB9 into our zoning ordinance and have adopted specific design and development standards where allowed under SB9. 
So when you said size limitation, was it because it was too big or too small? Uh, the feedback that I've received from the members of the public, property owners that have inquired about that, it's been that the 800 square feet is too small. So they were looking to add another, a, a bigger house as a second? Yes. So what, is that one of the things we may, we may be looking at for the permanent ordinance? ordinance? Is there a size that would make more, uh, depending on lot size, are we allowed to go larger than the 800 square feet and trigger the, that larger size based on lot size? I do expect that uh, the floor area and the height limitations would definitely be um, areas of discussion for permanent regulations. Are, do you think we're allowed, and maybe they, uh, Steve Mattis would have to answer this, do you think we're allowed to consider allowing it up to 1,000 square feet, wherein above 800, you have to have a certain lot size, a minimum lot size in order to? Yes, you could. Um, the, the state law allows cities to ab adopt objective design and zoning standards that would apply. And so as Andy has indicated, you could conceivably have um, different maximum sized houses as long as the minimum is always 800 square feet because that's the minimum that is required under state law. But you could say on X lot, you could go up to 1,000 square feet. On Y lot, you could go up to 1,100 square feet. So that's one of the things we can explore in Y you do this urgency ordinance because it takes longer than 45 minutes to explore how that might work. Uh, correct. These are just temporary regulations while uh, Andy and his team are and our, and our office are working on permanent regulations for the council to consider. And, and to go through the planning commission as well. Correct. Through the normal public hearing process. All right. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've, we're done with council questions. So we'll open up the public comment uh, period on this item. Any members of the public who would like to address the council on the proposed urgency ordinance extending the provisions of ordinance number 2212 related to SB9. Now is the time. If you're in the chambers, uh, we'll entertain you. And I'm not seeing anyone, so then we'll turn it to Zoom. We have no speakers on Zoom. Okay, then we're going to close the public comment period. And Mr. Mattis? Yeah, um, Mayor and Council, I do have one comment. Um, as, as Andy indicated, there's an errata sheet that um, does address uh, some of the issues that came in that were raised in the letter from uh, uh, CARLA. -C and I wanted the Council to be aware of one additional issue that they've identified. We don't think that the council needs to make a further change to the ordinance, but I wanted the council to be aware of what the issue was and why we don't think that additional change is necessary. The ordinance does involve in one section, does include in one section that the that under design review that there's an architectural compatibility standard and the, this, the letter from the advocacy group uh, raises an issue as to whether or not that is, in fact, an objective design standard. And I would want the council to understand that we specifically drafted that to be a very narrow review of architectural compatibility. And what we did was say that, that it has to have the same architectural style with the pre-SB9 primary dwelling by matching the building form, exterior, siding, and trim root form and materials and window placement of the main building. So we're very specific. The idea there is that SB 9 uh, says that any approvals by a city must be objective approvals. They must be able to be validated and verified. And there is some case law that has come out, not on SB 9, but on the Housing Accountability Act, where a city did rely on uh, on standards that were more flexible and could be interpreted different ways, and the court found that to be a violation of the Housing Accountability Act. We believe that this is narrowly drafted to make it something that can be objectively verified. The burden is actually on the city, if there's a challenge to that, to prove that, but uh, we wanted the council to be aware of it. So we think that the ordinance can go as drafted. I wanted the council to be aware that that concern was raised. If the council wanted to remove that standard, 
you could do that as well too, but but we believe it is narrowly drafted to comply with SB 9. That was the intent of it. I appreciate that clarification. I'm comfortable with the city attorney's explanation to the issue that was raised. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion with the errata. Oh, well, can I ask a question before I make the motion? Sure. Um, so, so it's now scheduled to go out a year and 15 days or 10, not 10, 10 months and 15 days. Um, if we get a whole landslide of requests for people, are, are, can we bring it forward or can, you know, how do, what do we do if, if by summer everybody thinks this is the best thing since sliced bread? So the, the council can always rescind the interim ordinance um, if, you, if you desire to do that. If you do that, then you're back to simply applying what objective standards you had in the pre-existing code and the applications would otherwise just move forward. Um, the ordinance is drafted, and I wanna be clear about this, it does not stop people from applying right now. People can apply and they can get units that are compliant with, with, um, uh, with, with the new law. And so what will likely happen is when the council completes its action, the Planning Commission and the council complete their action on the, on the new ordinance, then at that point you would repeal the, the temporary ordinance. And that does not have to be 10 months, and 15, 10 months and 15 days from now. That can be sooner than that. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm making the motion that we accept the um, uh, ordinance with the amendments that were on the dais um, this evening. I think that's sufficient. And, and just, this is a bit unusual, but this is actually a motion to waive reading, introduce, and adopt the ordinance. This is, this is an ordinance that can be approved in one meeting, and, and it does require a four-fifths vote, so it requires a unanimous vote of the four council members tonight. Exactly. Approval. That's what I meant. Second. Councilmember Brahaskio? Aye. Mayor Francois? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, and then our final item of the evening, we are going to adjourn today's, uh, tonight's city council meeting in memoriam of Fred Sanders. Fred passed away peacefully on Tuesday, January 4th at the age of 97. He was born in Dubuque, Iowa, the fourth of six children and a World War II veteran Fred served in the Asiatic Pacific Campaign and later earned his BS degree in mechanical engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. After moving to California, Fred served on the Walnut Creek Planning Commission and as a city council member for a number of years. Fred also served two terms as mayor of the city of Walnut Creek. He was predeceased by his wife, Georgia, his son, Craig Joseph Sanders, as well as his second wife, Helen. And Fred is survived by his son, Keith Robert Sanders, six grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. What a legacy. Tonight we honor the memory of Fred Sanders and the years he spent in service to the community of Walnut Creek.